very good morning everybody this is the third and the final day of our uh, presentations of phd scholars as a part of uh, phd coursework the scholars are making presentations on various topics on the first day uh, you all have made presentations on research methodology yesterday it was on the general area uh, of your research and today uh, you are going to make presentations on the specific area of your uh, research okay so uh, without wasting our time in any other things let us uh, start with our presentations i would invite first presenter alpa to come and start with the, the presentation okay Good, good morning, one and all. I would like to present my presentation of specific area that is on particular, that is drama. So I share my screen. I hope the presentation is visible. So uh, today's topic for my presentation is bringing drama to cl classroom, a theater performance based approach. You might have heard the word performance based approach in all the field and assessment through performance in all the free, uh, all the field. So I have joined out the word theater and performance based approach because when we talk about theater it is like a performance that is the synonyms or we can say the main word for theater content of my presentation that is history of teaching english literature then understanding drama the term in practical way then ongoing methods of drama teaching and another that is a theater performance based approach in classroom and then various techniques or we can say methods of drama teaching in classroom so first of all i must say that when english was introduced then it was introduced for the purpose of study as we can see here that one of the professors in king's college uh, f d morris who introduced the concept of uh, studying a set of books in literature classroom and he also said that in a way it is to emancipate us from the notions and habits which are peculiar to our own age and we move forward then literature became the medium for revolution and change in everyday life while we are we were studying so we were getting new ideas from literature that are worldwide and then there were many answer, question answers began like literature study uh, is good or language study is good it uh, language should be the main focus or literature should be the main focus and then we uh, we are doing both the things in the same class studying literature and language then i r richards as we know that came with the practical criticism a model of teaching in a way when he talks about the criticism of poetry so we can say that uh, there are many objectives as per the time changing with the method of its study and then we can say that about the broad area of english studies and it's serving purpose to men but it, all the things are changing in a way so now what is the scenario we have found that there are many methods in elt to teach english language i must say english language not literature 
so there are many uh, not many author who are talking about teaching literature but teaching language so we have many methods like direct method natural method silent way grammar translation method and uh, in a way we have a revolution or we can say evolution of all the methods so there is no more attention given to literature teaching there is more, more literature studies, but uh, there is no much uh, attention to literature teaching. So what we do in our classroom, we interpret the novel, poetry, or drama, or anything that is the piece of literature. So it goes by interpreting, by interpreting. Sometimes what happens that uh, interpretation becomes a dangerous, dangerous process. If teacher is only doing that and not uh, done by all the students and it also happens that uh, if it is done by students interpretation only then we think in a one manner only that we have to interpret this text if it is drama poetry novel or anything so what are the ongoing uh, drama teaching methods i have conducted a survey as a part of my research paper just some days ago and i came to know about these methods which are used by teachers, English teachers, to teach drama. Teaching of all genres like drama, poetry and novels are the same as I have received the questionnaire in that. So first of all, what happens in classroom? The teacher defines the term drama not in a practical way but in, but in a theoretical way as Aristotle has given the elements of drama and this happens, this happens, but they are not exposed to what is happening in a, in a practical drama or we can say performance. And another thing that is uh, most uh, popular in English classroom that is summarizing. Another that is interpretation of drama by teachers. It may happen that we come up with many theme, themes or we can say analytical things that it was happened in Hamlet or it was happened in this. So we can see from this perspective or this perspective. So firstly, we are introduced to those perspective. It is good to introduce those perspective, but before understanding uh, drama, if you are in, under, we are making uh, to introduce them a perspective, that is not good. Another that is we do thematical analysis. Uh, and we don't talk about drama, but about the drama. We are not talking about drama, but about the drama. Then another, that is discussion of characters separately. Separately. Another, that is direct reading of related literature. Uh, for uh, this la last point, I will give a case study or we can say an experience of a really good uh, drama teacher in last slide. Okay, so first, uh, understanding drama for before uh, starting with the performance based approach, I would like to make you understand what is drama not in theoretical term, but also in practical term. Uh, now, I would like to say that understand every word in a practical way because drama teaches us practicality, first of all, that is the first step. So in literature, a drama is the portrayal of fictional or non-fictional events through the performance of written dialogues. It either can be poetry or prose. They are all called, they are also called uh, plays. So in a way, when we talk about drama or play, then the script come in our mind, like movie script or any other, because it this uh, in this all the genres, we have dialogues in common. So how does the playwright develops a drama? if we are introducing drama in the drama class. So we have to focus how the playwright is developing the drama. So there are main six elements that we have studied in masters that are given by Aristotle. That is plot, character, diction, thought, spectacles, melody. If I ask you one question that uh, when you are talking about story in your mind, when you are making a story creative or it is influenced, so first comes a character in a way. Plot is coming there, but first the character is emerging in your mind. Then what the character is doing, you are observing that then becomes a 
plot. So in a way, it is a creative process. So uh, we have uh, we have seen that what is drama in practical term, but what can be the theater performance based approach that we can take in the classroom, in our own classroom. So first of all, breaking boundaries means what is classroom drama and what is theater drama. We have to break the boundary between these two terms because when, when we talk about classroom drama, means what we are teaching in classroom and theater drama, what actors are doing in the theater, in a way, we should consider it a same process when we talk about process. Then the development of drama that we have seen the six elements. So how to introduce the six elements plus a pose. I have added here plus a pose, a silence that we need to understand by to, uh, looking towards drama. Another first step, what we can do, reading sessions, not just uh, stereotypical reading, or we can say without tone or emotions when we talk about drama. So it is indeed necessary to understand emotions and mood of the situation, or we can say scene or characters. Then what happens next? Another thing, then we have to understand the context of the play. When we talk about novel or poetry or drama, the context is, we can say, important. So while you are exposing them towards the situation, in a way it is also situational based approach, performative approach, then th they can understand context in a very better way because they themselves are performing, they themselves are living for some time. Another that is theme. What happens that we uh, bifurcate or we can say we separate the theme from the drama, but theme is interwoven in the drama. So if the student is himself or herself uh, acting or we can say reading with emotions, then they can understand the theme. Then the teacher uh, uh, will not uh, will not require to uh, give them theme or we can say preach on uh, preach on themes to students. Then symbols. We talk about symbols that why the things were here in drama or we can say some things like a, a skull in Hamlet or we can say anything that becomes a symbol and it is uh, uh, signifying something. If the actors or we can say a performer or a student is using that thing while uh, conversation, conversation, then he can understand the importance of symbol or he can also uh, explore, them, explore them by discussions. Then distance. Uh, distance matters in drama because when all characters are uh, there on drama set and the proper distance is not maintained, then you cannot understand drama also when you are seeing. Because you can say, you can say that they are not in a, a good position. We can say there is a setting of of an office so there is a boss there is an employee so there should be a particular distance between them so it is shown through drama and the students themselves do that so we understand it better the distance then setting what happens when we talk about drama to students and it is english drama not indian drama then it is very difficult to make them understand about settings so what we can do we can uh, uh, give them uh, something, some things in a way, because we don't have much things uh, for settings in our classroom, but with limited equipments, they can create the settings of that uh, particular scene. Then another thing that is dramatic terms. When we are reading drama that is in our literature syllabus, then there are many terms which is coming in between like curtains, like lights off, lights lights on. So it is not just about this light. There are many other types of light on performance, in performance. So they come to know about those terms also. Another, uh, uh, seeing performance is better than reading or interpreting. Reading here is just a reading. Interpreting is about just interpreting. Means we are not involving other things in reading that I am talking about. 
So seeing performance in a way that students are performing themselves and other students are watching. So audience is also a main part of drama performance. So first of all, expose them to acting. I don't say that the students are really good actors and we are here, with, we as a teacher are here to make them actors. But at least they come to know how drama works, how it functions for that person purpose we have to expose them towards acting distributing the roles and characters how you are introducing them towards acting because they will not be able to catch up all the things you can first what uh, first you can do distributing roles or characters if you have five to seven uh, roles in the drama then you can uh, distribute among them so they can read as per the role reading with emotions First, they will surely read without emotions, but as a person, you can uh, make them uh, to understand the emotions, then they will understand by their own. Creating the setting with handy materials, which is, which is in the classroom. Meeting experts in the field. It may happen that uh, the person who is performing drama he is not having much that uh, degree, the so-called degree sometimes, but he is master of uh, teaching or we can say uh, drama techniques. So that can be done by meeting, by exposing them towards the experts in classroom. And in a way, it is not the preaching method, but it is workshop kind of a method when you are making it them to perform. Another that is soliloquy. We have uh, many soliloquies in a literature drama uh, like Iago sol soliloquy, Hamlet soliloquy. So, uh, what we can do if we have don't we don't have much time? So they can also perform soliloquies if they they are not able to remember all the drama because we have many dialogues. So there is a long process when we talk about drama. We cannot make them to do in two days or three days. At least uh, fifteen days, at least. And there are uh, other ways. Maximum uh, in maximum days we can do more. Then another that is audience space. Now it comes the uh, question of understanding. Uh, when we talk about drama, then student, sorry, the teacher is preaching. So now it is the better method that audience themselves are coming after watching the drama, that what they have felt, what they have understood uh, through the scenes, first scene or second scene or third scene, they are summarizing what they have gained in their mind after seeing or watching. So that can be done. Asking about X and actions, that is uh, under that topic, the audience space. Another, that is interpretation by students. It can be done after watching it, uh, what they are seeing in the drama. That is the concept here. Pedagogy is uh, discussed in last, so I will not discuss that. Okay. So there are some... Uh, critics or we can say practitioners who are what they are talking about uh, teaching teaching literature so ellen shoulder critically thinks about the way in which literature is dealt with in the classroom we do uh, she said that we do care about literature perhaps but we lack our own voice in shaping the pedagogy but this book introspects into the techniques that are normally used in the classroom the role of teacher is changing. He or she is not just a preacher as it was in the past that we have studied the history. Then we have also gone through the NEP 2020, which is focusing on vocational courses. So for vocational courses, we have to uh, we have to make them, them and students to expose towards skills, how they can develop for the world. So in a way, this pedagogy is helpful in this way as according to NEP 2020. Another case that I want to discuss, that is Michelle Cadden. He is a professor and he has studied his drama course from Yale School. And he is saying that plays are not mean to be read. If you see them in the theater, many decisions will have been made through the rehearsal process. But no matter how good a reader, a student is, it is extremely hard to imagine the performative possibilities of the text. 
so my role as a teacher is to bring out what's on the page and help them to set up and provide that performative supplement for themselves they have to be active the designer the director all the collaborators who make up the theatrical event but potentially it's more exciting than teaching a novel or poem for students studying drama can be like discovering a new world here i would like to erase one thing as per my understanding i have taken here because i cannot remove and take this but potentially it's more exciting than teaching a novel or poem so we can say that there there can be another pedagogy for teaching no novel or poem that can engage students uh i would like to introduce you with uh, another circular that has come some days ago that guidelines for engaging professor of professors of practice in universities and colleges here the ugc is uh, giving a right or we can say giving a uh, facility to colleges or universities that they can invite a professor of practice who are doing that in a way uh, we can say that if i am teaching management to you or students but i have not experienced experience the management in a proper world or we can say in market but someone who is there who has experienced that and contributed in that field so he can come and uh, teach for at least 4 years uh, it cannot extend to 4 years the, the main is for 3 years but it cannot exceed for 4 years so uh while concluding i would like to say in the classroom of literature creative and crit critical distinctions are made that stop to bring performance in the classroom another that is uh, that is taken from ellen shoulder i would like to see an erosion of the boundaries between literary criticism and creative writing between teaching and acting between that abstract ethics of theory and real ethical moral problems involved in the teaching material that raises every difficult human issue from racism to suicide these are the references thank you if any questions or comments yes uh, you just say that uh, while teaching the drama one should take performative approach right but how can a teacher uh, make balance between explaining the techniques of drama and the particular drama itself because more drama for example shakespeare's drama it has its own its own uh, depth so and we don't have that much time as you also uh, said uh, further in your presentation so how can one take balance in between in excelling techniques yes and also uh, for performance uh, no for performance you have to explain techniques no but you have to make them prepare that uh, this is how you have to perform this and you uh, you uh, prior in prior well in advance they have to uh, make their own script also no for example if the drama is very lengthy and you said that we can we, can, we don't have that much time so a kind of summarized version of the particular original drama so it 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 may take somewhat much labor from i and how can one balance my question is that uh balance we have to provide them more time because when we were in bachelor or we did drama so there were not a, a limit of time we can say but what we can do we can take uh, if if we are here to develop their approach then we can take one act place as there are many one act plays in science uh, syllabus or in a commerce syllabus that uh, that can be introduced at initial level in compulsory yes yes my question to you is uh, can you name one or two aspects of traditional pedagogy for drama teaching that should never change uh, i 
think I have mentioned some pedagogies that is interpretation, summarizing that is in that is in technique that we are using or teachers of drama are using that is traditional. Yes. So it is not changed yet because I have taken a survey some days ago and the strategies were still there that we are summarizing 50% or 60% are the teachers who are summarizing that. So it is not changed yet. No, it is not changed though even uh, even if it is up to change that certain things that is there in traditional pedagogy that we think should not change. Uh, it is it is the mindset of teacher that you are talking about that it should not change. No, 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 no. I personally ask you because traditional pedagogy is not completely a fail at its place. We just need uh, to do some changes and maybe a majority changes, but few changes are there. Sorry, few things are there that are already ideally that are better at the place. That should be continued. Uh, I just uh, read your question. What I am finding that uh, most of the techniques or we can say teaching a pedagogy uh, that is going in class, they are not appropriate because oh. it is not with the practical approach. That should be changes at, as per my understanding. Good morning, everyone. This is the third day presentation, myself, Asmita. And uh, here I am presenting for my paper number three presentation for uh, paper three, that is the particular area of your research. Nowadays, we all notice one thing that uh, uh, writers, especially English writers in India, they are adapting more and more mythical, mythological themes and characters for their work and represent them in a fresh and a different way. The question arises in our mind that uh, uh, why mythology fascinates so much? This is as an introduction, I would like to explore this question that why mythology because it is the past no and there it is the fictional there is no history it is myth is not history but yet myth is not fact but it is lie throughout the time so the basic question is why mythology fascinates writers even today in 21st century the first here in the slide, uh, here is the quotation of uh, Stephens and McCollum. And they are quoting this in their book, Retelling Stories, Framing Culture. In which they quote, and here I quote, myths are thought of as expressing timeless and universal significance. 
this is the one reason that why it is fascinated fascinating writers even today the another one is the quotation uh, of carl jung and it is uh, cited in the book uh, uh, by edited by adler and hull and the title of that book is collected work by c n jung where jung cites and jung says according to it is his views that means are present in the collective unconscious of the society so why it is present even today here because it is there in the collective unconscious of the society and that is the reason why myth uh, is uh, playing very fundamental role in forming in the structure of any culture and society why uh, uh, when a writer adapts a mythical theme it gives the benefit to establish the instant recognition for example if a woman even the character of that woman uh, uh, a character is uh, the name of the character is not sita and yet there is a particular situation when she is asked to prove her virginity at that time suddenly we connect that thing with sita that we find in ramayana because we all are very aware of that reference so it helps to uh, the the writer to establish instant recognition with the art and with the reference so this is why the another person is uh, uh, lori honko in his book the problem of defining myth where he says that myths are multi dimensional this is the reason myths are multi dimensional and a myth can be approached from 10 different angles and the most important is that there is no authorship one sh cannot one should not uh, take any permission to write on uh, upon the mythical thing and he can mold he can represent in a his own in his his particular distinct way the matter where he wants to uh, represent his uh, he can express in his uh, own way so this is all these are the reasons why myths are fascinating the modern readers uh, modern writers so much retelling of mythology in contemporary english literature in india in english literature we know that uh, the english literature from the uh, initial stage it had a great impact of roman and greek uh, mythology similarly in india english indian uh, english literature has the great impact of uh, indian mythological uh, scriptures and when we say indian mythological uh, scriptures um uh, basically hindu scriptures and particularly the ramayana the mahabharata and some stories from puranas these uh, are uh, generally ad being adapted for retelling and the two epics that is the ramayana and mahabharata are religious as well as social treatises because it does exist in our society in one or another way it is like a social contract so mythical how the writers are adapting from different perspectives the mythical themes the first one is uh, here are some examples there may be some others but i have just take the uh, few of them uh, humanistic approach a uh, humanistic approach uh, for example amish uh, tripathi's uh, shiva trilogy it uh, is uh, he, where he represents shiva as a human who by his exemplary deeds turns into god so there he treats the theme it with a humanistic perspective the another is sabalchan mahashweti mahashweta uh, devi's uh, draupadi is an example where she gives the uh, subaltern perspective she presented the uh, theme uh, with that pers subaltern perspectives historic perspectives raja rao's kanthapura uh, where he draws uh, analogy between indian struggle for independence and uh, lord rama's struggle and his march 
along with his army to rescue Sita. And the, another, the most important, because it is related to uh, uh, that my uh, presentation. And the last is gynocentric. Uh, Professor K. R. Srinivas Iyengar's uh, epic in English, uh, Sitayana, which was published in 1987. Uh, it is a striking example and uh, it is a kind of trendsetter, which is a long narrative poem about Sita. Basically, Ramayana is about uh, the original Ramayana that is considered as Valmiki's Ramayana and it is written by uh, Maharshi Valmiki and he is being a male. Uh, it is uh, mm, the, the, the feminists and the critics are uh, criticizing that it is pro, uh, presented through the male perspectives. Now he, the uh, professor, Mr. Uh, sorry, Professor K. R. Srinivas uh, Ayangar, he is uh, presenting, representing the same theme with a uh, female's perspective, that is Sita. Uh, the uh, uh, recent uh, writers in this genre are Chitra Banerjee, Kavita Kane, and Amish Tripathi. They are the three writers that I have selected for my research, and they are the um, they have adapted the mythological content, and I have analyzed uh, their uh, selective work from feminist perspective and uh, tried to find find out uh, uh, distinctiveness of their feminist perspectives because they all have their their own perspective their viewpoints and how they there is some difference there is there are some differences in their presentation and that i i uh, my focus is to locate that those differences the first is the forest of enchant enchantment by uh, chitra benerji deva karuni where sita is the protagonist in original novel, it is Ram, but here Sita is the protagonist. And uh, this is the retelling of uh, Ramayana from Sita's perspective. And Sita is transformed from traditional meek and uh, servile woman to, to a rebel, warrior and trailblazer, setting her own way among the wild. The another quality, the another distinct characteristic uh, I have just noticed is that the women characters, the other marginalized women characters in the original Valmiki Ramayana, they also get their voice. Here I have taken the quotation from the novel itself, where the, and here I read the quotation, write our stories, our story too. For always we have been pushed into corners, trivialized, misunderstood, blamed, forgotten, or maligned and used as cautionary tales wrote, written by Diva Karuni. This is the quote from uh, Palace of, uh, sorry, uh, the Forest of Enchantment. The another quote. I'm going to quote, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, recite that quote. It is from Bhattarai. She, is, she has written actually the review on the novel and that uh, her review I, I, I have taken verbally. So a fierce conservationist, dutiful but bold daughter. So this is the um, uh, characteristics of Sita, how Sita is, uh, sorry, it is, yes, no, yeah. So uh, uh, now how, what are the characteristics of Sita? Sita is represented in this way, according to Patarai, that a fierce, Sita is as a fierce conservationist, dutiful but bold daughter, protective sister, Loving yet willful wife, perfect helpmate, sensual lover, courageous fighter, skilled healer, learned counselor, strong mother, kind yet firm daughter-in-law, nurturer and adventurer. She reveals in her own being, is mindful of pleasure and grief, of empathy and understanding 
and is brimming with dignity for herself and for everyone else. She is the original feminist. This is how Diva Karuni has represented Sita in her novel. The another novel of Chitra Energy is The Palace of Illusion. It offers Draupadi's viewpoint and traces Panchali's life story from birth and lonely childhood to her adulthood and death. Her companionship, these are the journey that are captured in the novel by the novelist. Her companionship with Daima, friendship with Krishna and her boldness, boldness sorry, boundless love for her Dri, that is her brother. Chitra Energy here focuses more on the human side of uh, Draupadi. In original Mahabharat, uh, Draupadi is uh, claiming or he is, she is set as a responsible factor to invite the whole um, war of uh, uh, Mahabharata. But here, the Chitra Energy has represented the human side of uh, Draupadi. Uh, U.M. Nandita, in her paper, uh, revisiting the Mahabharata, where she cites, uh, where, where she quote, uh, she uh, says, and here I quote, beginning from her relationship with her brother, divine connection with Lord Krishna, and her budding friendship with Subhadra, and her final re reconciliation with Kunti. Multitude of relationships and its impact on her persona are highlighted by the author. This how this is how uh, Chitra Energy has uh, represented Draupadi in her Palace of Illusion. The another writer is Kavita Kane. Uh, in, in an interview with Ashish Gupta, uh, she says uh, that, uh, here I uh, quote, as a writer, I wanted to spotlight the marginalized characters, especially women, and see them as individuals as persons of a family, community, and society who each have their own story to tell, who have questions to ask for which they demand answer. Being a, she was, by profession, profession, she was a journalist. And uh, uh, as being a journalist, uh, her concern with the common uh, marginalized people are reflected in her selection of uh, the protagonist of her work. She chooses the women who originally, in original version, are uh, marginalized by the female writers. Um, uh, thus, readers get a uh, chance to uh, uh, read the Ramay Ramayana uh, from Surpankha and uh, Ur Urmila's perspectives and uh, Mahabharata from Uruvi and Satyavati's perspectives. These are the uh, Surpankha, Urmila, uh, Uruvi and Satyavati. These are the marginalized characters in original version of the uh, respective uh, epics. Uh, in Karna's uh, wife, uh, that is uh, in Karna's wife, the outcast queen is the title of her, one of her novel. And uh, the protagonist is Uruvi. And uh, what are her characteristics? How has she been projected? She is a uh, um, uh, liber lib liberated, liberated, individualistic, and progressive verbalized woman. So this she is presented as the uh, empowered woman, power uh, with a voice. Um, she is a kshatriya princess who bravely chose to be the second wife of a suta, the class discrimination. And she takes the, her stand. Uh, she is a woman of her choice choices who willingly takes up the challenge of facing social exclusion by marrying the man she loves. And, uh, decision. She, she takes the decision of her life um, and it is her choice. She is educated, well-versed in arts and music and well-trained in horse riding. Uh, she is complete in herself. Uruvi narrates her own story along with the story of Karna, providing a feministic perspective of the Mahabharata. Uh, the another novel that I have taken is Sita's sister. 
where Kanye selects Urmila, the biological daughter of King Janak, as uh, her protagonist. And a scholar, uh, she is, Urmila is a scholar who is invited, who is being invited in philosophical debates. And she questions the unemotional decision of her husband, the unjustifiable act of Sita's fire ordeal, and about the th dharma a man is having towards the woman around him. So this is how she questions. That is very important. The question should be there. And if one feels injustice, and he can or she can raise her or his voice, especially her voice. The third and last writer is Amish Tripathi, where I have selected his two novels, Sita, Warrior of Mithila and The Immortals of Mehula, the first version, the first part of Shiva trilogy. Let's talk about Sita, the warrior, uh, warrior of Mithila. Here, Sita as a form of resistance. Sita is presented as a form of resistance to the patriarchal norms. Now, all are the characteristics we are going to witness uh, um, below. They are following characteristics are against the patriarchal norms. What are the patriarchal norms? We can define, we can point out the patriarchal norms. Uh, for example, here, Sita is taught the three dharma as well as martial art. Basically, um, a girl is uh, trained to be uh, the ideal uh, female, to, ideal, to be ideal wife, ideal daughter, ideal sister, and a, basically ideal woman. But here, she is taught the uh, Sri Dharma as well as martial art. And that is very important, uh, even from the practical point of view, because it, this is very important for her safety too. So this is how. The second one is Sita and Sunaina are seen as empowered female, uh, adept in military activities and statecraft. Uh, while in, uh, yesterday we were talking about um, uh, Institution, uh, institutionalized uh, uh, of uh, power, right? So the uh, there is no um, representation to the female. Now here, Sita and Sunaina both are active in all the, the these fields, which is basically uh, considered as the male's field. While Janaka, Janaka in contrast, Janaka is the male, but here he is presented as the passive philosophical person. Amisha Sipa, uh, Smith, uh, Sita is a valiant woman, intelligent, powerful, and adept in warfare, who would single-handed combat the enemy of Mithila. She is sent to sent for formal education, engaged in religious ritual. Yeah, again, yesterday I would like to connect that uh, here. Uh, the basically patriarchal norms that women cannot do some things and basically they were deprived of basic in, uh, education and Mary Wollstonecraft the initial argument was that she should get formal education. Here Amish has presented uh, her Sita the, um, um, that is something that uh, opposed or challenging in uh, present life we all are educated but in uh, the background of the novel is uh, that ancient one and there Amish has represented Sita who who is going to Gurukul for formal education she is engaged uh, in religious perspective she is performing the religious rituals too uh, she is also active in public domain as I said and an uh, uh, excellent administrative that uh, her um, image uh, that kind of image is created she is presented as a ruler who is making decisions for the wellness of her people and King, uh, kingdom. So basically, the woman empowerment. How a woman empowered can um, brought up, can bring up, and can be implemented. So all these aspects are uh, adapted by by Amish, and that she he has applied all these elements in her in his uh, novel. Uh, so uh, uh, this is uh, basically very interesting. And Amish Smita is a warrior, as the title suggests, uh, and uh, it is. The, uh, the another, uh, yes, the last one is there. The Immortals of Meluha. And where Sati, Lady Sati is the epitome of uh, women empowerment. Uh, and uh, uh, she is extremely beautiful, but her qualities transcend with physical uh, feature. The ideal combination uh, set by patriarchal norm, uh, beauty with brain. 
and uh, from males these picture we get from the male's perspectives um, uh, amish has presented that sita is uh, sorry sati is beautiful as well as warrior so uh, both qualities should be uh, there now uh, she is a fierce warrior with unmatched martial arts as like sita also and courage and compassion just like sita she fights fiercely to protect the villages of uh, each uh, each other tripati's feminine perspective is more masculine because he engages his women more in action while banerji and kane presents the psychological side of a woman this is how um, uh, these three writers have adapted the similar source of mythology and represented with their distinctive feminist perspectives uh, thank you uh, this is uh, it from my side now if there is any question i welcome just a Do you find this way? I am saying, I am sharing my screen, so you are not talking. Yeah. Okay. Oh. 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 Okay, sir. So that is uh, the advantage of time scale. So we give it a particular format: zero, zero, colon, zero, zero, colon, zero, zero. That format is the format. Then automatically, uh, you do uh, find scale. So uh, here also we get all the chapters in the right hand side, and just by clicking on that, so that we can.
Is it there on the screen? Okay. Very good afternoon to all of you. Very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, today I am here with the topic Pilgrim's Way and Dati by Abdul Raza Kurna and uh, the reading of Buildings Roman uh, as a term uh, for this two text. Uh, first of all, we will have introduction of an author, then introduction to the text, and then the term Buildings Roman. Abdul Raza Gurna, uh, born 20th December 1948, is a Tanzanian novelist who lives in the United Kingdom. He was born in the Sultanate of Zanzibar and moved to the United Kingdom in the 1960s as a refugee during the Zanzibar Revolution. Gurna's writing, uh, Gurna is awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature uh, during uh, in 2021, that is so recently, for his uh, uncompromising and compassionate penetration of the effect of colonialism and the fates of the refugee in the gulf between cultures and continents. He is uh, Emeritus Professor of English and Postcolonial Literature at the University of Kent, that is in uh, London, England. Having moved to England at an early age and experienced displacement and the pain of non-belonging, Abdul Raza Gurna presents characters' experiences mirror his own. So we also find somehow uh, the autobiographical elements with his writings and characters that are fictional uh, in his eight uh, novels and the four of them uh, I have taken from my research as well. Gurna's characters are presented like uh, Tijin's branching off uh, his own personal life. It is not a wonder, therefore, that he is able to present details of the character experiences the way he does, uh, he does in his entire oeuvre. A remarkable feature that detail, uh, what remarkable feature that we find with his uh, writings. That is uh, the detailed description of the experiences of his character, uh, characters as they relate with one another. Then application of variety of narrative voices that uh, Gurna successfully uh, strategize, uh, uh, uses the strategies of narratives in his writing. There is also a muted narration, narration technique. Uh, and there is also uh, uh, this um, unreliable narrator uh, in his uh, unreliable narrator in his desertion. So uh, in novel, uh, Hira, uh, with his narrator, also applies so many techniques to narrate the uh, the, the, uh, the painstaking uh, traveling and the journey of their lives. He does not present the colonizers or colonized binaries where racial discrimination always originates from the white colonizers. He presents the re, uh, reality of the community by uh, letting the reader into its uh, malfunctions, uh, malfunctions, uh, squibbles, hopes, and aspirations without privileging colonial interferences. He rather provides to his readers to take place of judgment, delve into the lives of his characters, and draw, uh, draw conclusion about experiences of the characters. Now, the introduction to the first text that is Pilgrim's Way. The novel was first published in 1988. The protagonist of Pilgrim's Way is Daud, a biblical figure that is David. He is an uh, immigrant to England from Tanzania, works as an orderly in Canterbury in the 1970s. He experiences the racist abuse from skinheads and the feel of being dejected. There are different forms of foreignness. There is the foreignness of the newcomer, of one who has yet to familiarize himself with a new environment. And then there is the foreignness of a drop of oil in a pail of water. This is more than a temporary state. It is the true existential form of foreignness, something insoluble. I truly agree uh, with a lot of uh, reading, uh, sorry, a lot of my reading uh, with her uh, post-colonial writers and diasporic writers, this thing we find um, many times, and most of the times, uh, I must say, 
that is uh, the metaphor of pale uh, sorry oil in a pail of water that can never insoluble which uh, with each other the migrate uh, migrated people the minority or subaltern uh, class that migrated to a host land that they never be the part of the complete or entire culture and the society or the nation forever so it always the binaries and the boundaries remain there and as the ordinary uh, uh, depiction of the life of an immigrant as he struggles to come to terms with the horror of his past and the meaning of pilgrimage to england uh, <clears throat> fate could have dealt you such a body blow too and you might have found yourself as unfortunately miscast as i chased from one heaven to another wretched and despised say doubt in pilgrim's way it takes the form of physical assaults insults or more looks depending entirely on the location on the street he is in danger of being beaten while at work more subtle forms of humiliation awaits for him yet the most uh, harrowing aspect of his situation is not the actual violence but rather the fact that by being marked as an outsider daud is robbed of his own story the society he lives in is not interested in his past uh, rather uh, we can say that throughout the novel uh, i am at the uh, middle part of the novel uh, so by the end uh, it is quite disclosing but still we find that uh, daud's past is not completely revealing it has under many layers and get revealed by one one and the other it supplies him with a new identity he is uh, one of many even his name is ultimately unimportant he is a black an oversexed uncultured lazy walk this language is probably by white people for the black nigger people he gives people what they expected for him he is not even trying to clear the idea about him he plays the nigger a bitter parody of the role his environment has written for him quite touchy line 1990 published novel has a portrait of a black woman that is dirty of immigrant background growing up in harsh conditions in racially charged 1950s england her feeling of being rooted uh, rootless in england the country she was born and grew up in even though she was born there she was not accepted completely because uh, uh, she was a the person uh, who was not completely from that origin from that land her feeling of being uh, sorry the novel's protagonist attempts to create her own space and identity through books and stories reading gives her a chance to reconstruct herself they will be sorry this english man he said i'm telling you that what will they do with this nigger people these are dangerous people i don't have to tell you they will steal white women and rob the english man's house they are criminals england england will be ruined they make everything dirty i have some of this uh, jamaican niggers living in my house in bristol a nice house before i came in i take pity on them everywhere they go the landlords say no no dogs no children no niggers in dati this uh, uh, this dialogue was uh, said by uh, the landlord of dati and he was addressing her as well so yes this is there uh, many post colonial literature and writer we, uh, with if we come across we find this thing even this um, uh, they will still white woman we can also find franz fanon's uh, in, in franz fanon's uh, black skin white mask uh, his doctor of thesis and he is uh, also disclosing this thing there as a white psyche for black people buildings roman now the word buildings roman what it stands for in literary criticism a buildings roman is a liter literary genre that focuses on the psychological and moral growth of the protagonist from childhood to adulthood that is maturity in which character change is important the term comes 
from the german word bildungs that is mean education or alternatively we can say that forming forming or uh, forming of one's own and roman that is novel and also a sense of uh, uh, fresh and new further reading of buildings roman in this two text uh, i would like to start with uh, finance one quote uh, one, one quote epigraph that is if uh, psychiatry is the medical technique that aims to enable man no longer to be a stranger to his environment i owe it to myself to affirm that uh, that the arab permanently an alien in his own country lives in a state of absolute depersonalization in the stated epigraph franz fanon applies the idea of depersonalization in reference to north african arabs who through sustained <coughs> maltreatment at the hands of skin hat that is colonizers developed a sense of known being depersonalization is actually a psychological disorder uh, which hunter sera and david uh, during 2004 have defined as an uh, experience in which the individual feels a sense of unreality and detachment from themselves they have further explained that condition often triggered by other mental conditions such as anxiety panic depression and schizophrenia the way uh, finan used the word depersonalization may not be in that strict uh, reference to the uh, clinical condition but as a, as a way of explaining a condition in a way that somebody is made to develop sense of known being through sustained maltreatment if the artistic uh, ability or a gift of the buildings roman is to be taken into the consideration both daud and dati are uh, decidedly artistic in their imaginative creativity both engage their ima uh, imagination in highly artistic way as to create stories about their surroundings dati in one uh, instance is said to see the man who named, uh, named her walking with a little girl on the street actually the person is not there it is uh, inside her head while daud has uh, sorry when daud has a little narrative for most of the characters he uh, interacts with not withstanding the fact that these narratives are far removed from the reality so uh, it happens uh, further i will uh, discuss the thing pilgrims way and dati uh, what was that ha uh -huh. there is also one uh, narration i find uh, in tony morrison's the bluest tie the situation of getting demented uh, with certain uh, circumstances of uh, the white person's mentality and psychology towards black person that treatment the mal treatment towards them that causes this kind of thing as well the narration uh, of harry ape suggests this kind of the same level but the, uh, uh, same level that it, it suggests this this thing as well so that uh, person in alienation creates a hallucinations and uh, characters in their brain inside their head and they are talk to the they, they are uh, in conversation to them they soothe their doldrums of uh, this particular things and emotions and psycho psychological uh, purgations pilgrims way and dati are about growth they narrate self formation as already stated elsewhere physical growth is uh, accompanied by emotional maturation intellectual improvement though marked to a large extent by pessimism that comes as a result of perpetual suffering in the process they have to contend with hostility and discrimination in their daily lives the two protagonists show an improvement of status or a strong promise of a positive inclination this kind of creation of character is strongly of the building from and form dati shows positive development advancing intellectual uh, intellectually and socially her siblings do not fare as well Uh, they are bent on self destruction and ended up either physically or morally dead daud also goes that is way and strives to improve his status daud's colleagues at work his drinking buddies girlfriend she is white catherine a nurse who is also working with uh, with him uh, go a long way in acting upon his development 
Dadi can be seen as having failed to parent her siblings after her parent uh, parents are not there. Uh, her mother was also died at the at she was at the age of 16 uh, or 17, and she was parenting uh, her younger siblings uh, lone, lone handedly. But at personal level, she manages to raise herself above the the uh, drudgery into which she was born through focus, uh, resilience, and uh, tensity. That day and doubt, uh, doubt, uh, sur uh, surmount barriers, but not without discouraging moments in the journey. Instances when depression sets in the uh, despon uh, despondency abounds. As tensions build up between them and the other characters, it is easy to note what sets them apart and brings them success in the end. The resilience uh, that the author endows them with. Conclusion. Uh, Gunnar's narration of growth and transmission in these two novels has no option but to remain unique. As Neyman points out, the dislocated and melancholic individual is haunted by his past. The past and its sense of uh, instability remains a constant reminder of the character's non-belonging. Reading this text as Bildung's Roman is a justification of Mac Williams' contention that the form has taken a new meaning, partly removed from the ideology of its past. Lastly, I would like to uh, come, uh, refer to the one quotation by Edward said, I quote, Expo uh, expatriation or exile for the intellectual is restlessness movement constantly being unsettled and unsettling others. You cannot go back to some earlier and perhaps more stable condition of being at home. And alas, you can never fully arrive, be at one with your new home or situation, I unquote. Thank you for listening to me. These are the references, the two texts, and one thesis by uh, Anne Ajulu uh, Okungu. I have uh, uh, taken this topic as well as justified with uh, the argumentations given there. And beautifully, uh, she did her work in her thesis that is uh, quite helpful for this topic. Thank you. Okay, give your answers in the comment. Okay, okay The screen is already shared. So greetings of the day, everyone. Today, as a uh, as the presentation of my specific area, that is hypertext fictions. Two of them are short stories, and two of them are hypertext novels. I'm going to describe or present a brief overview of hypertext and what is the role of reader. With starting with double in hypertext novel. Uh, uh, specially designed on story, play, uh, story space platform with the illustration of 12 blue uh, work by Michael Joyce. Introduction. So hypertext was a uh, term coined by Ted Nelson, commonly uh, Theodore H. Nelson, commonly known as Ted Nelson in his, no, uh, in his work, um, Literary Machines in 1960s. And he was uh, trying to describe how we view the words in in a form like the traditional meaning of hypertext is like hyper means above beyond everything that is 
in greek sense in latin sense it means to weave something in a spool or to connect something with one another that is a weaving so um, ted nelson with the help of digital device uh, and with the help of certain protocols designed a kind of text which has this uh, primary pro protocol of html that is hypertext markup language and technocritic stress the origin of this idea where from where ted nelson had borrowed this idea of hypertext uh, it was borrowed from whenever bus essay as we may think wherein he describes um, uh, the, the concept of memex that is memory plus index uh, and in this memex he uh, this uh, bush describes the analog of the human brain and how human brain generally operates it's in a uh, string like in branch of uh, as a branch of tree human brain is working from one idea it turns to another then it takes snap of the uh, totally different idea this way a human brain normally operates and uh, from that he got this idea of um, to go in a deeper level and to bring the idea of hypertext and uh, which ted nelson actually uh, brought forward in the area of literature uh, so hypertext as our brain is working in the uh, is always in a fragmented manner so there is no uh, concept of particular specific beginning or ending it is always fragmented uh, how a hypertext fiction can be read if it is fragmented then how can we, uh, how can we read it as a reader Uh, and uh, my presentation will bring forward the light uh, on the role of reader and author again going to the uh, discussion of authorship and readership with the illustration of 12 blue so uh, first of all understanding what is hypertext as ted nelson who is the pioneer of hypertext fiction had uh, defined as a non sequential writing there is no particular sequence uh, text that branches and allows choices to readers readers are given particular choice uh, Uh, to best read as an int on the interactive screen so it can be read on screen not on uh, as on the book as popularly conceived this is a series of text chunks connected by links which offer the reader different pathways we are given different areas or different links to jump to or navigate to another definition given by george p lando says that text is composed of blocks of words so there is legia which we jump from one legia to another legia chunk of text or block of words uh, linked electronically by multiple pathways again chains or trials in an open uh, open ended perpetually unfinished sexuality described by the terms link node network web and path all digital terms we are uh, given here now if there is, if a kind of text or literary text is this much complicated where we have to make efforts to read then why there is a kind of aesthetics behind the hypertext let us understand that so there is this aesthetic uh, functioning of multilinearity there are multiple reading paths available to read the text that is chunked in some way as uh, some kind of linking mechanism that connects one link to another uh, chunk of text there is this uh the which is uh described by hills and there is this fusion who describes it as a poetic the aesthetics of hypertext a poetic way of thinking that emphasizes analogy over analysis so basically a machine is involved a digital uh platform is involved and um with the it is connected with literature so there is the involvement of digital uh, technology gives a kind of logical uh logical sequence for a non logical or illogical ending so we are borrowing we are taking the help of logical for an uh, going to an illogical thing it the, it has this idea of anti novel particularly we have this idea of a novel traditional novel how it it starts from some point it ends at some point there is linear structure there is a uh, flow of narrative which helps us to derive to meaning or to end but here there is the concept of non linearity which is always uh, which is obviously self destructive in nature why it is self destructive because we are deconstructing the text we are destructing the original idea of novel of linearity of um, of narration uh, then writerly text how uh, if we are reading a traditional novel traditional uh, print novel then we are 
um, not writing actually. We are reading whatever is written by the author. Here we have a writerly text wherein we are democratical. We are free to engage ourselves to uh, to navigate to links, and we are actually reading by navigating the links. So it can be interpreted in all possible ways because it is a kind of democratic process of reading. And uh, all the meanings, all the interpretations wherein we derive some interpretation, all are valid, all are considered as valid interpretations. Then there is textual openness, intertextuality is there, uh, irrelevance of distinctions between inside and outside. Like uh, there is nothing called a particular author of the text. We are also uh, generating the text. Now, the, now there is this distinction of traditional literature with uh, electronic literature, wherein uh, Powell, uh, Jim Powell describes it like it is a death knell of hierarchy, origin, presence, purpose, moral consciousness, genres, death, form, and design. We have this particular kind of format of uh, looking at traditional literature or uh, incorporated in traditional literature. But now coming to this electronic form of literature, it has this empty form, no for particular form. It is a play of words. You are taking chance as a reader. There is anarchy, process, performance, happening, absence, dispersal, and text intertext. The woven, which is described by Powell. So now coming to reader, there is this concept of writing, W R I T I N G. There is this uh, concept of reading, R E A D I N G. Now we are mixing all both of them in order to make a new term, reader. Uh, reading plus writing is equal to reader, starting with double. So reader is uh, not a passive entity. Uh, if you are reading a traditional text, there is no uh, input from our side apart from interpretation and evolution uh, but we are here actually writing the text in order to read it it is multi-dimensional because there are variety of interpretations variety of meanings incorporated in one text which a reader can interpret and found, find it valid interpretation also the function of reader merges with author that is tangible form of co-authoring here we are co-authoring a text as a reader According to Michael Joyce, again, the pioneer of uh, hypertext fiction, reading and writing in order we choose where our choice changes the nature of what we read. Because we are given multiple options, whether we want to navigate to this link or we want to navigate to uh, this picture or we want to hear the audio from the text. So we are making a choice here as a reader and our choice will uh, give us or develop the narrative uh, narration and uh, we will derive meaning from our interpretation of the narration. In the words of Michael Haim, Lando informs, as the authoritativeness of text diminishes, so too does the recognition of private self of the creative author. So we are forgetting su uh, such thing as creativity, particular format of reading, analyzing, evaluating, interpreting the text, or uh, we are basically going to from text to anti-text, from particular meaning to variety multimodal meanings again of the, uh, as described by Astrid Anslin uh, you might also feel from this idea from this description that why right to read the, this kind of text at all because we are feel restricted we are disempowered by the uh, variety of uh, choices we are actually making efforts to read this thing and we have to make decisions in order to read if we are uh, if we are in the middle of uh, something and the, and the character is going through a um, crisis and in the next episode, if we are navigating, then the character is very happy. So <laughs> we have, will have to comprehend, interpret within ourselves that what is happening actually in the narrative. So this leads to a feeling of frustration. But uh, as what Anselin um, convinces is that readers are actually given a chance to participate in empowering collaborative projects in which literary hypertext is read, discussed and created jointly rather than in isolation. So there is this uh, concept of isolation which is completely diminished uh, and avoided. Now coming to authorship and readership discussion which we had earlier uh, in previous uh, presentation. So the, there is this focus uh, which is um, there in the production of the text. Now, uh, the genius of author, the the creativity of author actually dies when we are reading hypertext because in hypertext, we ourselves are the writers of the text. Already the author had uh, put this hypertext on a particular platform, given us choices, then we are making the choices and we are reading 
and interpreting uh, from our side. So there is, uh, we are going away, our focus is going away from literary genius of the author and we are shifting towards the text he has produced and behind which he has to disappear necessarily once the text has been manifested. So once he uploads the text on the platform, then he, his role is completely diminished, nullified. The functions of reader and the writer becomes more deeply intertwined with each other than ever before. So there are divergent readings produced. As I, if I am reading a novel, starting with W again, if I am reading a novel, hypertext fiction, then I am producing divergent readings, uh, divergent uh, variety of interpretations. And uh, the more and more flexible and more and more non-sequential uh, is the arrangement of plagiarism. as the more, the more and more there is a chance that author will lose the control of the text. So this is how authorship and readership are connected. So uh, here, again, going back to authorship, if I am as an author designing a, a text, hypertext with uh, giving options like we have this uh, particular very famous tale of hair and tortoise we have this if you heard they uh, they participate in a race and then uh, which is the character who wins the race tortoise huh. so uh, we, if i'm giving you if i'm creating a hypertext i'm giving you two options you want to be a hair or you want to be a tortoise then you are selecting tortoise so you are moving forward in a race, assuming that you will have to win because you are slow. Your speed is slow compared to hair. So when, once you are uh, um, uh, facing like uh, the hair runs fast, then there is this option. If you are uh, tortoise, then you uh, see hair uh, right in front of you. And uh, you ask her that, why are you uh, resting here? He says that I am having two options. I am, I want to take a nap, I want to rest. So if you are clicking, again, now you are not tortoise, again, you are hair. So if you want to take a nap, then you are taking a nap. Again, 30 minutes nap, then you are jumping to that link and you are given 30 minutes nap. Okay, so obviously this kind of narrative, this kind of uh, choices are given to readers and they develop a story. Now, you know the whole idea, whole tale of hair and tortoise. That is why you can uh, relate to it. But here in hypertext, there are uh, not any uh, particular plot or particular characters, uh, characters who are developing in uh, traditional novel. We have this plot and characters who are uh, ruling the sphere, entire sphere of novel. There is this plot and there are characters, round characters, flag characters. While reading hypertext, you are not aware about who are the characters you are reading, who are the, uh, who are, whose are the lives you are navigating or experiencing so links not chosen by computer program the, the author puts the link then he is intentionally putting the link and he is controlling the entire process from big uh, from beginning to end once he uh, once he is aware that i have put this many links and reader can in interpret this many meanings then he is far from the novel with his presence actually is present in the novel because he ha he knows that there's a kind of interpretations can be made by reading my novel or my hypertext fiction, but he is away from the novel while the reader is reading and writing simultaneously. Now coming to 12 blue, as I had shown you earlier uh, in yesterday's presentation, the, uh, the overview of 12 blue, it was first hypertext story. It was considered as first hypertext story developed by Michael Joyce in the year 1996. He was a professor and he is pioneering author and critic of electronic literature. And as a fiction writer, he has used the story space platform. The story is divided into eight different bars. You are given links to navigate to any of the random bar. Readers are set with minor and major characters that keeps going through the bus. This is the whole idea. Uh, and it is it has this interface of blue color. Uh, Joyce writes that there are 269 links available in one hypertext. And I assure you my uh, uh, from my experience that one can never finish reading a hypertext or interpreting meaning from a hypertext. It is always continuing experience once i am reading i am reading in a particular mode then again after uh, after my reading if i am uh, frustrated in the middle of reading the text i am leaving the text it is completely upon me to leave or to continue reading if i am leaving the text then again i am uh, starting from the beginning it will obviously ask me to start from beginning so if i am starting from the beginning then i am lost with 
different interpretations and meaning and uh, different plot lines which I will have to generate. Now, reader in 12 Blue, how, as a reader, what is the kind of experience? So the story infinitely extends itself if we are participating as a user of hypertext. New relationships in a shared network and no clear-cut boundaries. There is no boundary, there is no particular end. Reader finds no be beginning or no particular ending as we had in traditional text. Not only the story is a network of lexis, but also is reader's mind. Our minds are also wired in, in this manner that we jump from one, per, uh, one uh, thought to another thought very quickly, taking snaps of different, different aspects also in this process. So this is how human memory is working, human mind is working. And in the similar manner, if we are given a text uh, which has this function of human mind, then we are not able to digest test, uh, that text. That is the... A challenging idea of hypertext which is providing so it is a kind of loop there is a cycle of characters plots ideas interpretations every entry at each step forward will lead us to a fresh point to explore the unfolding or, or to unfold the narrative so this computer interface uh, acts as the mediation for uh, for a literary uh, creation so code facilitates the reader or user with variety of choices also at the same time it delimits the other possibilities possible traditional ways of understanding and interpreting the narrative so this is basically a new kind of thing here you are given pictures you have to click on picture and you will find to uh, you will jump to another link everything can be read uh, read every surface and silence every breath and every vacancy every eddy and current everybody in its absence so here what the author is trying to say everything can be read in uh, uh, there is the possibility of reading each and everything uh, when it comes to electronic literature so sometimes we feel like what to read from this thing how can we interpret meaning from this thing here the role of author comes that it can be read now uh, again coming back to there is complete dissemination of meaning while reading 12 blue or any kind of digital hyper, uh, hypertext novel uh, read readers collaboration there is this collaboration from the side of readers which gives us multi-dimensional flow of narrative we can if we want to start reading we can start reading five times a day six times a day and every time we are given different beginning different ending different middle of the plot then there is a sense of uh, we had the sense of closure uh, for traditional text, which is completely disrupted in reading hypertext novel. And it is completely upon us as a reader to continue or to leave the text. When I was reading, I found that uh, there are characters, uh, there is one character is, uh, who is dying in one episode, then he is <laughs> emerging in the next episode altogether uh, without any uh, point or connection. So when I was developing the characters, I was experiencing the characters, I found that there are uh, the, uh, heavier Samantha, uh, Lyle, Lisa and Oril, this kind of characters I found till now after reading five times this particular hypertext. With this kind of narrative pattern, a reader can never really view the complete picture of 12 Blue. He is always in the uh, dilemma whether they, this thing is actually happening or not whether this thing is a dream for of someone or not. So the thematic unity is lost. There is no sense of plot. All the characters are appearing, dying, reappearing. So everything which a traditional text is giving us, everything that uh, this hypertext is um, denying all the aspects, all the uh, characteristics of traditional novel. So, uh, but how, to, why to read? Because it is an electronic art form. So themes are also viewed in plot. After reading some amount of text, uh, chunks of text, you will find that there is this theme of failed marriage, lust, death, frustrations. Uh, we can observe while reading. Because we have this sense of reading a paragraph and then deriving meaning from unseen paragraph. We used to do all these things. It is proved by research that human minds operate in a non-linear pattern, exploring infinite number of thoughts, aspects, topics, etc. And in the similar manner, this hypertext fiction has this possibility of interpretation, the understanding and meaning construction from this disrupted form of uh, uh, text. So it is a quality attributed to hypertext in making of an art. 
Now, Hypertext technology facilitates new way of creating, organizing, designing a literary text, and that is why it is included in the aesthetic or artistic literature, uh, making himself aware of uh, more participatory and interested. The reader actually infringes upon the hegemonic power of writer. Till now, we have this particular writer who has this particular uh, thought in mind, and then he uh, creates a uh, artistic text, and uh, the readers read the text and connects their mindset with the mindset of the author. This was the traditional artistic idea of exploring or analyzing a text. Here we have this reader who is simultaneously writing. So he is collaboratively authoring the text and that is how this concept of reader emerges. And uh, uh, with the evolving uh, evolvement of hypertext, we have this idea of readers uh, at the same time. Because to read or analyze this, interpret or this kind of text. So Derrida had quoted Derrida to conclude my presentation that if today the problem of reading occupies the forefront of science, it is because of the suspense between two ages of writing. Here we have different two ages, have, uh, electronic and traditional, print and screen literature, electronic literature. Because we are beginning to write, to write differently, we must reread differently also. We must try to interpret differently also we must try to develop our mindset to uh, uh, to accept this kind of forms and uh, in the artistic genre as the aesthetic literature also so i unquote this quote, uh, quote is taken from of grammatology written by derrida here are the work citations and questions are welcome thank you everyone then can be done and uh uh, what you should do uh, is uh, that uh, you you have to like prepare a small text uh, for this. So when you talk with people, then you can give them that. Well, here is a platform and here is a text. Now try and read. So if ten people are reading that text, how are they reading? What are is coming on their screen? And then you ask them that what is the storyline that came on your screen? So that you will have to try to see and then you give some modern poems hmm. the group and then you ask that how they are reading so if a very modern abstract poem uh, deadest poem or uh, images where the audience is reading completely different uh, things if similarly that is happening here then there is a point of debate uh, that you will have to investigate that what is there that in the abstract or postmodernist literature also same thing happens same happens there. Yeah. There the text is static. Whereas here text is not static. Uh, hypertext is not static. So is there a play of meaning that is happening in both? That is a traditional fixed text, but it is not traditional literature. It is a postmodernist literature. And here it is a different. So small modules you have to prepare. Like you can start with small poems, then short stories, or this uh, uh, what we call it social media stories. Twitter fiction. Micro fiction. Micro fiction kind of thing. So that you'll have to see uh, and observe that how things are being uh, understood by the audience also. So to give the feeling of being a reader, W R E R, to the people also. Okay. Thank you. All right. Am I visible? Should I, should I go back? Good afternoon. I am Kishore. Uh, the topic that I am about to discuss today is Kantian reading of Manju Kapoor is a married woman. Manju Kapoor is a novelist. 
and uh, yesterday we discussed a lot about Immanuel Kant and his theory of moral uh, the, his theory of morality and the theory of freedom that we talked of so today what i am going to do is i am going to locate this particular fiction or this novel in the framework of Immanuel Kant's parameters of morality and in the uh, framework of uh, Kantian theory of freedom so before we move on or before we understand the storyline of that particular novel we need to have a understanding of the life and works of Manju Kapoor which will give us the fundamental idea of her writings and also what the motive that she writes with. Manju Kapoor was born in 1948. She is still alive. So she is an Indian Punjabi novelist and she is a professor in, of English literature in Miranda House which is, the, which is affiliated with Delhi University. She won the 1999 uh, Commonwealth Writers Prize for her first published work that was uh, difficult Daughters and the second novel that she wrote uh, it was written in 1998 Difficult Daughters and now the second novel that she has written is A Married Woman uh, that is in 2002 and then Home 2006 The Immigrant 2008 and Custody 2011 now what is the uh, what are the issues that Manju Kapoor uh, mostly touches the issues are uh, given below the first is patriarchy inter-religious marriage family bond etc now, why did I uh, talk about her rest of the novels? Because uh, Manju Kapoor in one of her interviews, which I have not given the link of, but if you type in YouTube, you'll find her interviews, very short interviews and very uh, precise and very substantial interviews. Therein she talks that whatever I write, it's a reflection of the society. The, she is very traditional in her outlook, saying that literature is a mirror to society. So she just reflects whatever happens in the society and the meaning out of it is to be taken by the readers because she leaves it to the readers how to take it and how not to take it. So uh, coming into the story line of a married woman, what happens in this particular story? Let's see. Married woman depicts the story of Asta. She was a woman of upper middle class uh, working family. She was from Delhi. Asta finds herself trapped within, uh, between the pressures of modern developing society and ancient biases. Now, why did I uh, uh, put this particular second uh, line is because Asta was a girl. Uh, she was a woman who was educated. All right. And her family uh, members, that is to say her father and her mother, they were the civil servants and they wanted their daughter to get married as soon as possible. And to get their daughter married is a matter of privilege for every parents. It is a, again a underlying patriarchy that is working and operating here. But that is what I'm telling you the facts. Now, after she gets married, then we will understand what actually happens. But her married life is not satisfied and is, her married life is not happy. And what are the reasons? Again, there is patriarchy. The reason is because Heman, her husband, will we'll go slide by slide so we'll understand it. Now, after she gets married with Heman, then her married life is not happy. And uh, why her married life is not happy is because she is just a willing body at the night in the bed of Heman. And that's it. Her feelings are not taken care of, her concerns are not taken care of. And how is so? Why is so? Because once upon it, uh, at one point of time, the uh, in fact, this novel is set in the backdrop of communal riots which took place uh, after the Ayodhya and Babri Masjid issue. In 1992, uh, that, what, that is what had happened. And in 2002, again, the riots in Gujarat. So these are the historical events which cannot be forgotten. There are the uh, uh, horrible events so at the backdrop of the, uh, the historical event this particular novel is said asta she uh, she wants to go to ekta yatra she wants to accompany piplika khan she was a widow of a muslim husband she was hindu basically but she gets married so inter-religious marriage is also the theme of this particular novel which is explored by manju kapoor in fact it's a reflection of facts that is what the novel uh, she in the novel she talks of most of the times now in this particular story what happens is she wants to go accompany Piplika Khan for Ekta Yatra. Ekta Yatra connoting unity, fraternity and brotherhood between Hindus and Muslims after that communal riot. But Heman thinking her of uh, a woman does not allow her and resist her to sin. The reason being she cannot be the political character. That is what his point of view is. So some of the other way there are certain uh, restrictions which are being put on Asta one after other. That is what our uh, investigate. That is what we will find here. 
now what happens asta joins peep at the theater but even at the regardless of the resistance of uh, heman asta joins peep uh, for ekta yatra also and also to watch gay film regardless of heman's resistance heman also doesn't allow her to uh, join uh, to accompany uh, peeplika khan to watch the movie which was a gay film uh, but then also she goes all these are the things which are actually rebellious now rebellion does uh, rebellion is a, uh, in in fact it is sort of signi- uh, it's it's signifying that the patriarchal system has to be resisted some or the other way now she is exercising freedom exercising self choice that why is it that i cannot go why is it that i cannot accompany piplika khan for uh, uh, even to watch a, a, a film gay film and uh, even ekta yatra so despite the resistance of heman she acts in accordance with her autonomous will now the real shock to reader is when asta does, now there the relationship between piplika khan and asta also develop asta is not satisfied and happy in a married life the reason is because she is just a willing body at night in the bed of heman and nothing apart from that as a result of that her concerns and her uh, her worries are not taken care of she loves her children that's it that's the only thing and she wants to uh, she, even she wants to become she she gets a job heman is not satisfied with her job also and these are other things which are there and because of the dissatisfaction in the married life she get she meets a person uh, a widow of uh, a muslim husband and her name is piplika khan so she meets her and then they start of evolving the relationship which is considered in today's terminology as a relationship of lesbian lesbianism that is lesbian relationship i have seen the interview on this that is of manju kapoor she said that i never intended this relationship will turn out to be lesbian relationship so even the author did not intend that this story should go this way but it happened in the process of time but she wanted to reflect the issues of the society that is what now hakil i uh, locate this particular story i i explain you the story now it's time to locate it in the concept of immanuel kant's theory of freedom first thing yesterday we discussed about the theory of freedom and as i told you that immanuel kant wants self choice to be the fundamental aspect of freedom now self choice it means that action which i take will not will be decided and determined not by the external factors but will be decided by autonomous will that i have all right moreover there should not be material consequences to be taken into consideration while acting in accordance with the free uh, free will that also has been discussed now after having the relationship uh, with piplika khan there is one point of time when they had to separate piplika khan actually wishes uh, uh, she want she wants asta to accompany her and to give up the pat- uh, family and come with me and we will stay together but piplika khan's request or piplika khan's insistence is ignored at uh, at the end of the novel by asta and asta decides to stay back at her home and not to go with piplika khan even for this people uh, there are so many homophobic people in the society who blame it to bisexuality so do not have a relationship with a person who is already married that is what even piplika khan in the novel says because to have a relationship piplika khan she was single she was lesbian for instance that is what is shown in the novel and after she had relationship even sexual and what sort of uh, there uh, even love relationship that also has to be taken into consideration but then also she cannot have this uh, asta as a partner throughout her life because asta cannot do it asta could not step out of the house and accompany uh, uh, piplika khan and stay with her so therefore this act inaction of asta for not stepping out of the house was blamed by piplika khan to the concept of bisexuality that bisexual people are always dishonest because that is what bisexuality is all about bisexual means to have the comfort with both of the partners so th- this uh, bisexuality is blamed for it but according to me as i read this novel i come to know that it is not just bisexuality which is to be blamed but it is more than that because if we read the novel at uh, at the end of the novel we find that piplika asta was not happy and satisfied in her married life it was because that she was not provided the love she expected and she found it in the process of time with piplika khan because she was taken care of she was worried where is uh, asta etc where uh, she was worried about her whereabouts 
and therefore asta at one point of time started feeling that piplika khan i get love from her as i did not get it from my married life and therefore she starts evolving the relationship with piplika khan but at the end of the story we find that piplika khan also starts becoming dictating she starts uh, uh, dictating uh, asta she shouts back to asta she does not understand the concerns of asta so there are so many things which actually so in the story what i'm trying to tell you is that the concerns which were not taken care of by her husband were being taken care of by piplika khan, khan in the initial stage of the mar- uh, relationship but at the end of the novel we find that even uh, uh, piplika khan did not uh, accommodate her concerns and piplika khan uh, wanted her to accompany uh, uh, wanted asta to accompany her and then they would stay together so here the relationship started getting the different direction asta did not like this kind of behavior because asta thought that i was aspiring for love which would i uh, which i didn't get in my married life and i found uh, i found it here with you but even at the end of the novel that seems turning that uh, turning away and therefore she decides that i shall not go with piplika khan i shall stay back here now how do i locate it whether this decision which was taken by asta was taken under the pressures of patriarchy because isn't it uh, i mean will people not frown at her to give up the married life and to uh, get into the relationship with a person who is lesbian and to stay with her and to spend her life will it not hamper the lives of her children also isn't it so all these are the factors which are to be taken into consideration this is what people will think and therefore people will blame it to patriarchy even manju kapoor intended it to blame it to patriarchy so not to blame it to patriarchy but she reflected the facts and then the, uh, we people may judge or we people may uh, gather it uh, gather from this story that it is patriarchy which prevented her to accompany uh, piplika khan why because she could not give up her married life as a result why why so the reason was she was worried about her children the reason was what people will think of etc etc but that is not what uh, the fact is if we uh, studied it in a deep or if we have a very profound view of the novel and the story line we understand that if it was uh, patriarchy had prevented her to step out of the house then at first place she would not have stepped out of the house to accompany piplika khan to join ekta yatra right so this is also something which is to be taken into consideration and now how does it fit into the parameters of immanuel kant's theory of freedom the first thing that we have to understand is that immanuel kant said when we take action or when we choose something to act that action should be should not be susceptible of materiality susceptible it means influenced by materiality now you people may argue that uh, she did not go out the reason because concerns for her children prevented her so it is clear cut material consequences that prevented her but no not that not concerns but her love for her children so love is a abstract concept all right though the by product of her action is material immanuel kant never uh, said that the by product should also be uh, should not also be the material so materiality if it is the by product of my action but the motive should not be material that is what immanuel kant is all about all right in sartrean theory we saw that material, even the motive is material in the given circumstances if i am stuck and the circumstances are very oppressive and in order to alter the oppressive circumstances if i act so that action is motivated by materiality because i want to alter the given circumstances so even the motive is material but in case of immanuel kant i say then i argue that the materiality will not be the motive of the action and the self choice but it should be nominal nominal means not phenomenal not material all right so in this particular case that is to say in the relationship of asta's choice not to go with piplika khan even if she loved piplika khan and vice versa then also she didn't go the reason was because the love she was aspiring for later on started getting disappear uh, getting disappear and as a result of that she did not go to piplika khan this was a clear cut thing so there was no materiality involved no motive 
of material uh, though the no motive was not that of materiality it was a clear cut case of love so that is why i said that this particular novel has to be read from emmanuel kant's self, uh, perspective of freedom she exercises freedom freedom of what freedom of staying back freedom of staying back does not here staying back does not mean that she was prevented by patriarchal structures of society or patriarchal thinking of society she stayed back the reason was love which she aspired from piplika khan and also from her husband but disappointed both of the times this is what the story is all about and this is the way i have located it in uh, the, the theoretical framework of immanuel kant there is a lot to discuss but thanks a lot and this this is a bibliography which is a short one so thanks a lot if any question you can put it in the youtube so we'll have a discussion later thank you Where is the classroom? Can somebody please help me? I can't find the classroom. Sir, by mistake, someone had closed the Google Classroom. So, which is the email ID? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you uh, see the slide here? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. So my topic for the uh, presentation today is importance of role play as a pedagogy for undergraduates studying business English. So just a small brief that uh, from all the countries across the globe at the moment, only 69 countries speak English as their native language. 
and the challenges that are faced by non-native speakers of English as a language was something I was discussing yesterday. So taking forward from there, what are the different ways in which this non-native language can be taught? So as per the various discussions, even in the national education policy earlier during the times of Indira Gandhi and even right now in 2020, very recently, uh, there is always a rift between which should be the national language, which should be the, uh, you know, uh, the language that can be used to teach in classrooms and um, which should be uh, the language that can be used, uh, whether it in, in terms of, you know, uh, in the constitution or with the politicians, right? Um, but English is always one of the languages. So just a small little uh, check on uh, what I have read that uh, one of the states in the southern part of India said that we do not want Hindi to be as part of the curriculum or to be the language of instruction. And um, English remains constant. That is what I would like to put here. Um, that even uh, whether it is an Asian country, an African country, whether it is any country which has English as a non-native language, but from a very, very early schooling uh, stage as well, even in the higher studies, uh, the fluency of English is given a lot of importance. Um, coming to the main core topic of my research that in the corporate world as well, there are many, many companies who expect the students of B schools to be fluent with communication and to be fluent with English as a language, whether it is in the spoken, in the written form. And it becomes a real challenge for Indians, specifically students who are studying in B schools to be well versed with the lexicon and the pronunciations and, you know, at a large um, English itself. So it begins from a very young age. It becomes a challenge even for the teachers to teach the language. It becomes a challenge for the students as well. Um, but we cannot avoid the fact that it is necessary. It is necessary from the point of view of students who wish to gain um, a job or, uh, you know, to for placement purposes from the uh, campus itself and when the companies come to the campuses to recruit they are either recruiting the students for junior level for managerial level if it is an MBA school or PGDM school and uh, you know for sometimes even during for higher positions if it is you know the colleges like let's say university like I am they probably want to select students who are for higher positions in whichever ways there are certain um, kind of uh, research is done that uh, uh, there are various strategies in which uh, a teacher can help or a educator can help in students with students in learning the language very well and there are various pedagogies that can be used to teach a language more or less it is a lecture series the teacher comes explains teaches in the class the students can you know raise the hand ask questions this is something that we have all seen we have all grown up being a part of it role play is something that i'll also be explaining later on so we go to the third one that is the socratic pedagogy or the research discussions you know something that we have ourselves been a part of back in may where uh, the, the Lipsa used to come to the class and expect us to have read some material. And it is more of a discussion method. Then there are obviously flipped classrooms, which was uh, trending during the times of COVID. Uh, spatial pedagogy is not something that we normally see in English, but um, it means making use of spaces. It is more for students who are studying uh, archaeology or even architecture interior designing they also require the knowledge of speaking uh, in fluent english if they want to make presentations to clients and for jury members as well seminars is something that we all have been a part of blended learning as in it's a blend of both it's a blend of a flip classroom a role play or classroom teaching there can be various pedagogies that an educator can use. Task-based learning is where the teacher or the educator is going to give a task to the student and they are expected to carry the task outside the classroom 
and review it and give their own opinions on uh, you know what did they learn from that particular task uh, often times these are all interdependent like i say uh, and work successfully with the support from each of them so there can be two to three different pedagogies that an educator can use or more or less i think most of the educators do use a lot of different pedagogies um to learning of business english with support of these pedagogies interlink can enhance the pace of learning understanding and practicing the language for example in yesterday's presentation of mine i was talking about how there are certain students who are weak with the language poor learners it becomes difficult for them to learn the language in this particular case if role play is used those students also get a chance to learn from their own mistakes or upgrade themselves so every year there are so many thousands of thousands of students who appear for campus recruitment offers and corporates are flying from different places uh, there are mncs so there are companies coming even from uh, another country uh, and they look for talented and you know fresh uh, freshers or students who have just graduated or post graduated from a university and they can contribute to the growth of the company and that is one of the main reasons um, freshers are selected because um, they have the knowledge they have uh, studied they have done their internships and this helps them train those students from a very very early stage according to their company one of the major expectations that these corporates have from these candidates is to have a good hold on communication on their language that they should be able not to not just uh, you know to be able to communicate ideas in a meeting but even uh, while they are making presentation to clients while they are making presentation to financiers and uh, to be able to be both a team player as well as a leader whenever it is required for the candidates or you know the selected students who are uh, employees so role play is one such pedagogy that helps the student in learning of business english very efficiently at a very undergraduate level if it is uh, inculcated in uh, as part of the classroom practice it becomes interesting for the students uh, and it is also a very good teaching strategy so it can be incorporated in drama in simulations in the form of games uh, demonstrations of real life cases with regards to any of the topic a uh, majority of these can be acquired and polished with classroom pedagogies stated above uh, in my last slide and the subject faculty whoever is teaching uh, preferably has to have a bit of industry experience so that they can blend their own experiences as well and they exactly know how a role play can be conducted um i'll give you a very uh, small example uh, something that i myself tried and tested in my classroom so back in my previous organization i asked my students who i was teaching a particular topic on elevator pitch if they are uh, in a corporate building or in a networking area if they meet somebody who they can pitch their idea to or who they would like to send their resume to an hr manager or the even the owner or a proprietor of a company if they meet them near an elevator what are the things that they can talk what are the words they should use how what kind of body language they should have so i was teaching elevator pitch in my classroom a few months back and i asked the students to read something i asked the students what kind of dialogues uh, you know can be used uh, i also asked the student to view a few videos in the classroom itself and then i asked them to do a role play i asked the students that we have elevators on our campus as well i want you all to part into two groups or in a pair of two and probably you can ask one of your classmates to uh, you know take a video so i want one of you to uh, you know uh, take role play in uh, in a way that one of the person one of the student becomes the owner or the proprietor or the man hr manager recruiter etc and i want one of you to be uh, the student and aspiring uh, undergraduate student who wishes to be a part of that particular company and i ask them to uh, you know create a script of their own uh ask a classmate to take a video of how they would approach the person near an elevator or if they are part of uh you know a, 
a, a group of people who are already inside the elevator how can they strike a conversation and how can they uh, you know uh, break the ice what kind of question can be uh, asked and in an elevator you have about just a few seconds of time before you reach your uh, level or the floor so you have very less time uh, in which you can tell the person that look i'm interested in your company and uh, i am a very good candidate and whether you come to my college for recruitments or not but i would like to be a part of it and then i showed them a small clip as well of uh, this one particular um, series which is there on netflix and i asked them that you know this is how you also do networking now after all the examples that were given to them i asked them to perform the role play take a video and upload the video on google classroom and then we would all you know uh, discuss about who did what right and what can be done better what was more commendable and which particular team uh, had very very nice uh, examples that can be given even to the juniors later on so role play is one such pedagogy and i uh, got this idea from this one particular uh, um, experiment that was also done in a university in new zealand and they also made their students do role plays and then these are some of the uh, statistics that came in mind uh, at the end uh, the conclusion of that particular university and the researchers at new zealand was that there are so many students who enjoy role play they learn it better and 50% of the students thought that you know if uh, i didn't have the language ba barrier or if i didn't have that particular fluency of the language i could have performed even better so a role play helps them not just learn the dialogues it helps them like so, this is something that is was even uh, taken in uh, alpha's presentation that students get engaged more and they enjoy the process of learning even more if they are asked to engage themselves or if it is more of a practical approach now there are some of the limitations of role play as well um, if we are in a classroom setting that the teacher is not trained enough sometimes to conduct it uh, coming from a corporate background i knew uh, a little bit of how uh, an elevator pitch is done so i could explain it to the students now somebody who has only you know the experience of classroom teaching might not be able to train the students or conduct the role play or she might or he might have to go through some uh, role play um, seminars or you know be a part of some uh, certificate course in able to pass the knowledge to the students as well or to conduct the pedagogy now certain ruler rural institutes may not have the right facilities also to conduct the same you know how will they go to a corporate how will they practice their business english and in a role play method if there are no offices and role plays in certain villages uh, there are certain shy students as well who might find it very difficult to have that confidence to participate in a role play lack of vocabulary like in the earlier statistics it said that 50% of the students felt the hesitation because they don't have or they have not built the right vocabulary they don't have that fluency over the language uh, that comes to the next point that is poor grammar knowledge from the very beginning of their schooling life it hampers a lot uh, absentees who are not there in the class may also have an advantage and this also means that students who are a part of distance learning program they cannot participate in this so a uh, very short example right now the institute that i'm working with they have 200 students in each section but only about 50 to 60 students come to the class on a daily basis which means that there are always about more than 100 students who miss out on the kind of pedagogies that i'm trying to use in the classroom so that the study becomes even more interesting and easier for them especially during the time of exams it becomes easier to recollect what was done in the class uh and the last uh, limitation of course this might not be the last one but just the last one that i've put here is that students who did not receive enough opportunities back in the school days you know those who have not been part of co curricular activities they might have that hesitation of being or they might find it difficult to adapt role play those students who have only known that the teacher comes to the class teaches and i have to take down running notes i write the same thing in the exam so students who have not seen role plays inculcating may find it difficult to adapt and they might uh, not accept this kind of a pedagogy very easily to conclude i would say that learning the language becomes very very easy for students especially when we call english as a lingua franca as in 
uh, a language that is used in majority all of the countries whether it is for trade whether it is for commerce business by for networking by politicians for traveling leisure a lot of different things we need english uh, at least a basic knowledge of it for majority of the um, corporate work and knowledge of business english will set a higher expectation meter it is always a meter for those corporates who are recruiting students and learning business english has become important even if the job is that of an accountant or even if the job is that of a front desk manager they still need to understand certain lexicon and business english is something that even a receptionist at a resort needs to understand and speak so role play will help the students not just in learning it but learning it in a way that you know they can develop the confidence in them and some day when they have to from the classroom setting if they are recruited in a, a campus placement and if they go to a real life situation it becomes easier for them to blend into the culture of the corporates some of the references that i have taken here are already mentioned here thank you so much i will end my presentation here A good a good reference list was also very well uh, presented and uh, good uh, of uh, talking about personal experience is good that how you do uh, uh, with role play that is very significant also and uh, you can like uh, you, you can sit yeah uh, even in this case like uh, your case or alpha is working on drama there very practical things are there so you have to like keep on documenting your practicality by some videography photography so you can show uh, those uh, things are there it was just uh, uh, finding the things uh, here on the screen you can see see this <laughs> i'm sharing a screen is it visible <coughs> for example uh, the group of students here they are working on this grammar module that how it can be taught through role play or a drama kind of a thing or and how to ask a question eh, also eh, in a similar way and then they worked and prepared a kind of a small dramatic uh, uh, thing so that is one one idea that how you can like document your process and uh, this was like uh, photographs of the things which can be used when you make some presentations about uh, what is done by uh, students so when the activities are happening uh, in your classroom if you keep on like uh, taking some photos or small videos then what work they are doing and then how uh, uh, it can be presented also so classroom photos that also so uh, nowadays as we know that if you just talk and you don't document the things properly then nobody believes people say that you might have cut copy pasted from some other resources Uh, and uh, you are just doing that where is your uh, like real work that is the normal question so when you are working practically on the things when your students are working uh, then uh, it becomes more effective uh, to prove your point also 
Okay, next one. Yes. I keep on answering your questions huh, in the comment. Have a look at the comment thread and see if there are any questions. Then type your answer there. Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, myself is Lalji Baria. I am presenting the representation of spiritual identity with the reference of uh, Coelho's novel. Uh, first of all, when we are talking about the spiritual identity at the time, the question is raised in our mind that uh, when we are uh, say that uh, who is doing this work, at the time, uh, someone said that I am doing this. So, against we question opposite question that uh, who are you at the time the uh, uh, remain the gap between the identity so here i will i will talk about the spiritual identity so first of all i would like to introduce the polo coelho so what is uh, interesting to know about the polo coelho uh, first of all his biography so uh, as we know that uh, polo coelho is a uh, Brazilian writer. He, he he was born in 1947 in Rio de Janeiro, uh, and his life is very uh, critical. Like he uh, uh, become a part of politician, and he also gone to the prison uh, three years. And after come back, he write the book. So uh, he 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 was a uh, like an activist. And then he brought a song and lyric and novel also. Uh, about his family, uh, the uh, Polo Coelho uh, want to a writer, but his uh, family is crazy him. Uh, that's why uh, he also uh, into the mental hospi hospital. And again, uh, we, uh, he come back and write the novel. Uh, in his family, he also uh, married with uh, Christania. Uh, in 1980, uh, he has uh, obtained, uh, I think, no child. Uh, then about the book, he also written 28 book uh, uh, in the Portugal language and also English language. Uh, most of the book translated uh, in, into the English language. Uh, I think uh, it is more than uh, 80 language. So these are the books. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce that spiritual identity. So when we are talking about spiritual identity at that time, uh, we also connect the spiritual as a religion. But here I have to say that the 
spirituality it doesn't mean as a uh, religion but spirituality involves the term like love compensation or the individual self knowledge so it all things are connected with the spiritual identity the spiritual identity is to know god and understand who you are in a god individuals who find the reason for their life lives in god and are recognized by god can develop their true identity and discover uh, sapness and meaning for their life as we know that world health organization uh, taken one survey that and uh, they say that uh, in the world 230 million people also frustrated a lot uh, under that uh, 120 million also the children who depression first is so why people become a first step uh, what is the solution of the frustration depression and unsatisfaction so i think it is a uh, spiritual identity is one of the ways that can solve solve the frustration or uh, depression uh, now there is a, a types of spirituality uh, some of the people you can find that they work Uh, with a brief uh, meditation or quiet time to a spirituality prayer uh, service to their community spending time in nature spiritual retreat or yoga so through this way uh, people try to achieve the spiritual uh, quest or spirituality so these are the types of spirituality now uh, there is an example of uh, there is a way of uh, the spirituality people go through the uh, that way uh, other people express their spirituality through religion traditions such as like a uh, hinduism islam humanism sikhism buddhism christianity and judaism uh, judaism so people go through the religions for the spiritual way spiritual power uh, now i would like to introduce that spirituality versus religious so a spirituality it can be a practice individually and the religious is also the often a participate in a community uh, spirituality doesn't have to adhere to a special set of rules it is a free from the religious it, it is a beyond from the religions then the religion is usually based on a specific set of rules and custom so then you can see in the uh, tv serial that uh, some uh, some serial also talking about the religions in the early morning like asta channel so our oldest people also are listening there is baba and babi talking about the religious but it is not a spirituality often focus on a personal journey of discovering what is meaningful in a life we are uh, we also know that uh, people also following the money materialistic world and at the end they can't achieve anything so they waste the, their time and life from for the materialistic way so this is a not a solution then people achieve the money at the time uh, again the desire ha- happening to more achieve money so people not uh, satisfied through the material things at that time spirituality may be helpful so uh, religion also uh, often focus on the belief in you uh, these or gods religion uh, religious texts and tradition now uh, i would like to introduce the alchemist novel uh, the allegorical novel was written by bulo coelho in 1980 87 the novel was about an edition shepherds boy to follow a mystical track in which he learned to speak the language of god and he received his heart desire then there is a character santiago he is sitting under the tree and uh, he he has dreaming to that uh, there is a pyramid and there there are uh, treasure so uh, he follow the dreams and achieve the treasure uh so here question is that uh, what is an alchemist so uh, an early form of investigation of nature 
uh, a philosoph philosophical and spiritual discipline, someone who knows the secret to living forever, and someone who someone who can sense the base metal into gold, and someone who can cover disease. So alchemist means to uh, we can say that uh, like a kimiagar, uh, like a magician, uh, to sense the life. As we know that a gold is the uh, under the earth, and we can pound uh, into the uh, uh, digging to the land, so we have to found spirituality through our life. So how to we, how we can do this? So we have to go to deep into the uh, spirituality. Now uh, it is a fable. Uh, what is a fable? So it is a short narrative make a moral point. Uh, traditionally, by means of animal characters who act like a human being. A uh, legend about spiritual or mythical character or event. In the alchemist, there is a lot of uh, character and symbols who are represented as a fable. Uh, there is one, uh, uh, one of the animal like a sheep. So he represented as a uh, individual, lack of individual. So uh, there is a character as a fable. Now, uh, allegory and allegory is a story that symbolically represented something greater than just the story. The alchemist is a story about a young man, but he represents a philosophy of life. So in the alchemist, we can say that how to live our life. We cannot achieve at the end of life. Uh, uh, in the waiting for God, we can see that uh, God will come and uh, doing everything. but. That not happen. Never go that come. We have to search our life uh, within us. Uh, a representation of an abstract or spiritual meaning through concentrate or material forms. Uh, in the alchemist, there is a symbol of dreams. Uh, dreams, it represents a language of God. There is another symbol of a psychomore trees. Uh, it is a representative as a tree of lives. A uh, sheep lack of individuality, interpretation of God, omens, inner self, and the shepherd as a leader, spiritual guide. So these are a symbol who represent as a spiritual uh, spirituality. Now there is one character, Santiago's father. Uh, so Santiago has a dream to travel despite his father wanting him to be a priest. His father gave him a benediction. So his father uh, said that you have to do uh, for yourself, but he said that I can't do anything. So uh, he gives the ship and he travel a lot and he achieve a real meaning of life. There is one character, the gypsy. The gypsy told Santiago of his journey. She gave him her wisdom and uh, for a where to go if he hadn't of seen her, he wouldn't have no where to begin. So at that time, there is one dialogue in the alchemist that dreams are the language of God. We cannot interpret that there is a language or not. Uh, when he speak in our language, I can interpret what he has said. But if he speaks in the language of soul, it is only you who can understand. So here a language of universe. We cannot say that there is a word from the universe of language, but there is a sign, there is a sense, there is a feeling who uh, encourage us to the spirituality. Uh, another thing, there is a character of uh, Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek gave Santiago's rock to that when on his journey, he would be able to read omens. In the picture, you can see that there is a two stone, black and white. Uh, his name is uh, Urim and Thimim, uh, who was given by these, uh, by King, and when he he was confused, Santiago was confused at that time. He uh, see the stone, and when uh, this this stone gives to decision that you have to do this or that. So these are the symbolically you see here. There is one dialogue uh, uh, spoken by the King. The soul of the world is nourishes by people have happiness to realize one's destiny is a person only real 
obligation. Uh, there is one character, a uh, crystal merchant. Uh, when Santiago's journey start, at the time he meet one of the crystal merchant. He give him uh, as the crystal merchant gave Santiago as a job so that he could start his journey. He even let him get half of the profit made in his in the shop. Uh, Santi, Santiago want to uh, reach to the pyramid, but he has no money. So he tried to uh, work as crystal merchant, and he also said that our life as a crystal, like a glass. When we uh, do not take a breath, at that time people uh, bury us, bury us. So our life is like a crystal, like glass. Uh, there is one of the character Fatima. Uh, he also help him. Uh, he also described as a twin soul. He also talking about power of soul. She gave Santiago her love. Uh, he didn't expect to receive such love from a beautiful girl. When uh, Santiago traveling into the desert at that time, one of the Kabila and he meet Fatima. He also give love. As we know that in the real world, at present time, people don't give to uh, love, don't uh, pay to into other person. So at that time, spirituality lead to upon the love. Uh, there is one character, Englishman, uh, who always talking about universal language and happiness of life and treasure. Uh, he said that he believed in omens all all his life and all his study were aimed at finding the one true language of universe. The English man always searching to the language of universe during the whole journey with Santiago. In alchemy, it's called the soul of the world when you want something with all your heart, that when you are closest to the soul of the world. So that is a great philosophy of the spirituality. We can Spirituality leads to our curiosity. Uh, spirituality is a very uh, controversial topic. We can we cannot conclude that one sentence. So this philosophy is very high level. It was the language with which all things communicated. Uh, there is a center character of the novelist, the alchemist. At the end, the alchemist meet meet to Santiago, and the alchemist gave Santiago the vision to further his journey and the information was useful. There were, uh, the alchemists say that, listen to your heart. Sometimes we cannot listen to our heart and uh, and we do everything for other. We cannot live for us. So it know all things because it came from the soul of the world and it will one day return to there. So this is a, uh, this quotation is like a, a high level spirituality. Uh, there is famous quote you can uh, read here that life will be a party for you, a grand festival, because life is the moment we are living in right now. So we have to live our life, rather wasting time, time uh, behind the materialistic thing, for the money, for the satisfaction. So there is another dialogue the seer had told to Santiago that the secret is here in the present, you have to live into the present. You, if you pay attention to the present, what come later will be better. And the, at last he said that I have inside me the wine. We cannot found into into the world, everything into the within. A wines, the desert, the ocean, the star, and everything created in the universe. Uh, we were all made by the same hand, and we have to same soul. So this is the universal theme that we all make from the world that is greater than the us. Uh, love is force that transform and inform the soul of the world. Uh, when you want to something, all the universe conspire in helping you to the achieve it. There is a famous quote in the, the alchemist. Uh, the boy is through the the soul of the world and so that it was a part of the soul of God. And he saw that the soul of God was his own soul and that he, a boy, could perform as a miracle. At the end, 
uh, lesson from the alchemist is that uh, uh, trust yourself rather than another. Uh, read the seemingly inconsequently sign when you are reading the uh, novel at that time. Lot of sign and archetype character include by the Polo Coelho. Uh, understand that as you look to fulfill a dream, it look to find you if you eat. And at the end, sometimes you can find extraordinary ordinary in the ordinary. We can found uh, uh, extraordinary ordinary into regular life also. At the conclusion, ultimately the treasure lies within us. We cannot found into one, but within us. They uh, the key to discovering that, however, is that we have to travel, to observe, and to listen. The world is full of signs and omens if we take the time to notice. So when we are traveling, when we are living in the world, at that time, we have to observe all the things. There is one power into the universe to control the all things. So uh, that is the conclusion, and there are references. If you have any questions, so you can ask me and give your feedback the following email ID. Thank you. The questions in the comment. Yeah? Keep on answering the questions. If there are counter questions, then also you can put in the comment. So first of all, very good afternoon to all. Uh, here my topic on a specific area in a PhD study. And uh, my PhD topic is on the detective fiction with the four different uh, authors from the different countries like Agatha Christie, Sharadin Nubandho then uh, Daniel and Hagishino from the Japanese and the American author. So let's start with the Agatha Christie who is uh, recognized or famous for the detective fiction and uh, uh, for the uh, for her the a name which is the crime uh, queen and the detective in uh, detective fiction uh, as we know that in a golden age of the detective fiction at that time uh, she is uh, producing so many kind of detective fictions right up uh, agatha christie in full dame agatha mary Christa christie Nies Miller, English detective novelist and playwright whose book has sold for more than 100 billion copies and have been translated into some 100 languages. Uh, about uh, approx uh, 100, uh, uh, more than 100 she wrote short stories and 68 uh, numbers of the novels and the 19 plays that she has written. Uh, educated at the home by her mother, Christy began writing detective fiction while working as a nurse during the World War I. Her first novel, The Mysterious Affair, 
Ed Styles, which we also published in 1920, introduced her to Pirot, her eccentric and egoistic Belgian detective. Pirot uh, reappeared in about 25 novels and many short stories before returning to Styles, where in certain, and uh, she died. Here is the mistake of the typo and she is died in around 1976 the elderly spinster miss jen marple uh, pyrot and uh, miss marple both are the detective character in the miss um, uh, agatha christie's novel uh, as we uh, know that uh, some kinds of uh, limitations and some kind of technique which are different uh, both are using for to recognize or investigate the crime so when we talk uh, we, when we talk about the pirate that uh, uh, after this uh, next slide you can see the appearance of the pirate and the miss marples the miss marple is looking like a simple and common or uh, com common things and common way uh, the appearance of her and uh, pirate is like a professional way that portrayed the character by the agatha christie then this kind of the uh, novels which is written by the agatha christie's and which are very famous uh, famous detective characters, Pirate and Marple, are Presti's most well-known detectives, with the two features in dozens of novels and short stories. Poirot made the most appearance in the Presti's works in the titles that include Ackroyd, The Mystery of the Blue Train, and The Death in the Cloud. Miss Marple has been featured in books the, like The Moving Fingers and A Pocket Full of Ray, and been played on screen by actresses like Angela Le uh, Lansbury, Helen Hayes and Berlin McGuire. Other notable crisis characters include Tupins and the Tommy ba Bashford, Colonel Rez, Parker Pyle, and uh, Arindian Oliver. Now, when we talk about the name of the character Helen, so the uh, in uh, why uh, while I was reading about the Gatha Christie, that was uh, 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 that was a written write up uh, in that that uh, somewhere when was she was uh, 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 reading about the mytholo mythological uh, write up at that time she uh, mostly read the Greek mythology. So the character Helen is the coming from the mythology and it is a particularly Greek. Then, writing well into her later years, Christie wrote more than 17 de detective novels as well as short fiction. Though, she also wrote romance novels like Unfinished Portrait and A Daughter's Daughters under the name Mary Wells McCourt. Christie's success as an author of shell stories as earned her titles like The Queen of Crime and The Queen of Mystery. Christie can also be considered a queen of all publishing genre as she is one of the top selling author in history with her combined work selling more than 2 billion copies worldwide. Uh, Christie was renowned playwright as well with her works like The Hello and The Verdict, her play The Most Trap opened in 1952 at the Ambassador's Theatre and the more than 8,800 shop, uh, showings during 21 years holds the records for the longest unbroken run in a London theatre. Additionally, several of Christie's works have become popular movies, including Murder on the Orient, uh, Orient uh, Express and The Death of uh, Death on the Nile. Christie was made a dem in 1971. In 1974, she made her last public appearance for the opening night for the of the play version of Murder on the Orient Express, which is the very famous novel uh, by Christie. And Christie's died on January 12, 1976. So these all the writers from the various uh, countries which I have selected for my uh, PhD research. And uh, here, particularly, I have selected Agatha Christie because I have uh, read some, uh, which I selected works by Agatha Christie and I have read them. So these two are Sleeping Murders and Five Little Pigs. Now, uh, in a Five Little Pigs, there are uh, many assumptions, as uh, uh, Embargo Eco said that uh, uh, for the assumption, crime is a very purest form, and in that uh, way, in in that form, uh, detective, and while they are investigation the crime, they are make assumption not. Uh, directly judge that the person is the criminal even if they get more evidence uh, against him or her then even they make only assumption but uh, in this uh, work like uh, five little pigs there are uh, many characters like uh, Gwelda, then uh, Lily, then uh, Mac, Macbeth, then uh, uh, 
agree and uh, in that work uh, there is a five person uh, for against the uh, criminal kind of the evidence which is uh, found by the detective pirot and uh, he gives some kind of box that uh, please i have given the this kind of uh, paper you have to write up where now uh, when you are and where are you uh, fro- where are you there the crime was occurred so all the uh, person they write about their uh, evidence and that uh, where are they and uh, in the, in that uh, write up through the character detective poirot find out that who is the criminal after that uh, we know that uh, mo- so so many characters who are g- feel the guilt because of that kind of uh, criminal or crime occurs uh, now we can uh, 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 now i want to uh, say that about the la- uh, in a yesterday mem asked me that which kind of theories can be applied for the detective fiction and uh, its research so i say that uh, there is a comparison uh, comparison study or theory which we, i can or uh, the person who is researching uh, this kind of the novel or form so when we talk about the criminal that it, it behind that or beyond that we can uh, talk about the psychology right then the psychologically situation of the mind then uh, we can talk about the e- ego and super ego so that way also the criminal uh, or a, a person who is a human then even he make some kind of crime because of this kind of situation which are uh, occurring or uh, moving in his mind so Uh, recently we can uh, remember the uh, incidents or crime which is uh, happened in a uh, surat that uh, the love affair with between these two people grishma and fanel so see the uh, situation of the mind of the person who is the male and uh, how he doing the uh, the crime now i know that there is no any need of the detective because we all see the videos and all the things so uh, it is only a crime but we can see the psychology behind the uh how it is a role of the psychology for the criminal or crime and the agatha christie sleeping murder so now uh, when we talk about the character so here also the again i want to remember the character helen which is come from the mythologically uh mythologically works and uh, there is uh, one question or we can say that uh, how she why and why she use this kind of character and uh, as i told you that uh, she was uh, much reading about the mythology from the greek and that's why she using this kind of the characters helen and uh, another person who is whose name is lily also murdered by this somewhere someone uh, now here also uh, the love ship and the relationship uh, and uh, because of that the both character helen and the lily got the murder or killed by the person who are uh, relation with them so this way the sleeping murder and the five little pigs now this study or which i have uh, from uh, which i have studied from this the uh, uh, initially part of the my research and uh, there is the two things difference between the female character and female detective and male detective then the characters of the females in a uh, sleeping murder and the five little pigs both are difference their behavior their uh, curiosity to know about the crime because uh, clara in a uh, clara and colle both character in the sleeping murder they want to know about who is who is the person who did the uh, this kind of crime so that way we can also see and some way we uh, remember the things that uh, while we talking about the five little pigs and detective which have uh, uh, kind uh, some kind of technique he used uh, given to papers and write up and he uh, want to some uh, no uh, new uh, who he want to know about the uh, a kind uh, we can say the uh, where are the all the persons while uh, the murder was happen so while we are talking and compare uh, the tragedy and the hamlet that time we you uh, we use the word or sentence like uh, play within play so at that time we can say that uh, the person who feels the guilt he, and uh, some way he fears that uh, he feels the fears that i will uh, reveal that i have uh, did this kind of a crime and that with the expression of that person is different so from that expression also some assumption can be done by the detective and that way he investigate and the uh, after the all kind of evidence he got after that he revealed the person who is the criminal and uh, as power of his that he can give a pardon or the some kind of law 
than uh, the punishment or sin. So here is the work citations. And thank you. If any question from your side, then please. So very good afternoon to all of you, myself Nayan Vasan and today I am going to make a presentation on a critical study of select folk tales compiled by Grace James. So here in this presentation, I have selected some of the folk tales from the collection by uh, Grace James and tried to give uh, some hidden ideas behind the folk tales and also tried to give some glimpses of that folk tales. So first, Grace James. Uh, Basically, Grace James uh, is an author of English, author of children's literature and a Japanese folklorist. She was born in Tokyo, but uh, at the age of 12, uh, the family moved to England and settled there. And these are some of the notable works by the author, that is um, Green Willow and other Japanese uh, fairy tales. and. Uh, John and Mary. So the first folk tales I have selected uh, for the presentation that uh, the title is Flute. So basically uh, the story is about a gentleman whose name is Yedu and uh, uh, what is there in the folk tales that uh, his wife uh, uh, dies in, the, uh, in this folk tales and uh, he remarries with her lady. But uh, what uh, there in the focal is that the lady uh, does not like the uh, girl, which is actually uh, of the, is uh, the uh, Yedu's earlier wife. So uh, this lady does not like the stepdaughter. And once uh, father goes to a city for his uh, business works, and uh, when he returns to the home, he tries to find his daughter, but he couldn't do so. Then, and then later he comes to note that his daughter was killed by his uh, uh, second wife. And uh, this is the basic idea of the, uh, this is the glimpse of the uh, folk tales. So what is the uh, idea behind the tale is that the stepmother does not like the step daughter that is the uh, social issues uh, has been uh, shown in the uh, folk tales uh, then the second one is a uh, momotaro this is uh, also uh, another uh, japanese uh, folk tales here what is there in the folk tales that an old man and woman uh, lives a childless life 
and one day uh, the lady find a giant peach and she brings it to the uh, his uh, her home and she cuts the peach and found a little boy inside the peach and uh, the boy was very uh, sp- um, what we call that um, supernatural uh, power being and when he uh, grows up so the strength how much he has strength that uh, he can cut a tree with a knife only a knife only and when he grows more and become an adult uh, so then what the, there in the story he makes a journey uh, to an island land uh, uh, to the uh, demon island to fight with the demon and during uh, his journey he meets a dog monkey and pheasant a bird and they agree to help that uh, momotar a boy and finally they reach to the island and fight with the uh, demons uh, or giants and return home with a, a, a huge amount of treasure so this is the basic uh, uh, a glimpse of the uh, st- uh, folk tale and the idea of the folk tale is that evil is punished and the good is rewarded so this is uh, this is the basic uh, idea we can found in many of the uh, folk tales which mean to be uh composed for the children and then uh, next one is the tongue cut sparrow this is a story about an old man and old uh, woman husband and wife and uh, the old man has a, a pet sparrow but the woman doesn't like the uh, sparrow and once what happened the old man went off to cut wood and the sparrow was alone at that time and the old man cuts the tongue of the sparrow and send it back to the mountain from where it uh, came then old man come to uh, comes to his home and realize that what all had happened and he goes to search for the sparrow and he uh, reaches to the sparrow's inn and where he welcomed by the sparrow and other a sparrow and while he uh returns to the home uh the sparrow gives two basket uh, as a reward or as a gift but uh, and the first uh, two basket and the one was very big and the second was very uh, small so the man chooses the small one and he goes to the home and opened it and found the treasure inside the basket then what happened that uh the lady was very um curious about to know what was actually there in that big basket so she goes to that in and they pick up the big basket and uh, comes to the home and meanwhile on the journey he uh, she opened the basket and what was inside that um uh, snacks and uh, that is uh, diamonds were inside in the a uh, big basket and they uh killed that woman so in this folk tells what did the hidden ideas behind that there is a greed only leads to one's own demise and the second one that is uh, evil is punished and good is rewarded the next one is urash uh, urashima it is also a japanese folk tells uh, that the folk tells is about urashima he is a fisherman and once urashima show that a group of children uh, torturing a small a turtle and he uh, helps that uh, small turtle and the next day a huge turtle comes and carries him on its back to the uh, palace of the dragon at the bottom of the sea where he meets uh, that uh, the small turtle earlier uh, he saved it and the other uh as uh, creatures there and uh he spent some of the days there and come back to his home uh with a, a gift and he while he come to the home he find out that there are many of the year have been passed and uh, while he open the books and what uh, the things happen that he suddenly grows old and here uh basically i couldn't found any kind of uh, hidden ideas but 
uh, i may assume that it may be meant for the entertainment for the children and one thing we can uh, find out that uh, there is a concept of time travel that uh, he actually two or three days uh, spent in the inside the sc and actually it was equal to the 100 years <clears throat> then uh, the good thunder it is a story about rain then sama a mighty god who had a son named rai taru once god said his son to uh, took upon the doings of men and he saw a poor peasant and his wife were working in his rice field and the poor peasant worries about uh, his crop because the lack of the water so the god helped him and uh, the rain came so this is the basic uh, idea so here what is the inside idea of the folk tale that is the reflection of religious faith that is the uh, inside idea of the folk tale and the people believe that all natural activities are by the grace of uh, god because the unaware of the uh, science behind it at the time where uh, the story was composed so here there are some uh, themes of the folk tales i uh, tried to uh, make that is a fluid have a hatred and valueness uh, value uh, less of mother motherhood then momotaro have good rewarded that is the main theme that is tankat spero have a, a greediness is evil then urashima basically the entertainment and the good thunder have the reflection of a religious a uh, face a uh, faith these are some of the references thank you so it was good uh, uh, all of you did quite an interesting presentation on your specific area of the research and it seems like now the the very idea about the, how to do research what is your general area and how specifically you are trying to look that is clear so uh, the basic objective of course work also to see that uh, all the scholars become clear about where are they located you are located into an area from where you are trying to investigate and look at the things also uh, a few of the things which you can like look at the this aspects uh, when you do your further research as i told uh, alpa can look at you know, this practical aspects and this uh, what props are necessary in the classroom like when we imagine a traditional class we have a green board or white board or black board there or projector or mic system or fans tube lights benches to sit the same way if we think of a, a class where a drama is a pedagogy then what other props are necessary for like it, if it is handy then teacher can any time use those things so what can be those are things uh, what like what can be the design of that class that also you can look at and then how teachers can be prepared for that pedagogy that also you can add into your research so teacher modules about uh, how they can use a drama so you require a book uh, along with uh, uh, a chapter that if you want to teach the drama in in this way then there is some booklet so you can follow this booklet uh, kind of a thing so those can be the outcome of your research also uh asmita uh, you are dealing with retelling so anybody who is dealing with retellings of myth uh, and then the modern way it is told so uh, you have to deal with all these questions uh, the, even i think uh, kishore asked the question about history fiction myth uh, so all things are so mixed up uh, uh, that how you to differentiate from that and whenever uh, either history is told first time or it is retold or reread or reinterpreted any kind of hermeneutics is done to uh, this things uh, 
there is always contemporaneity which plays a vital role. So there is something in the contemporary which is driving people to either read in one way or to tell in that way. First telling also. First telling also are driven by some elements of contemporary. And there is uh, Michel Foucault who helps uh, in understanding this idea about how this knowledge, uh, anything written is a knowledge system, is connected with power dynamics. So who are in the power? And how they are like influencing historians or storytellers or mythographers to tell that story. So that connection is very important. So uh, if uh, any Islamic scholar is writing a history, he will again write so that his king is happy with that idea. So he won't, can't be objective uh, in that context. So uh, if the, if monarchy, they are always... Uh, like there is a pattern uh, uh, there and so then after some time when somebody is reading they are questioning those things that he might have done this because of these reasons so the same way when we see a character like Sita in Valmiki why in that way like Tulsidas why in another way why in the another time in a different way so today is a time where women empowerment is much in the air today you have to be politically correct so you have to always speak that Women can be powerful, women can be a warrior. Is it because of that only that Amish is writing in that way? Or there is something else also? Is that, so it is the, only the time in which you are writing. So to be popular among the masses, among the women, or to be politically right, you are telling Sita's character in a particular. So contemporary uh, uh, things, uh, ideas, concepts, events, people, they always drive uh, this, uh, this narrative. So that can be added into your discussion also. Jayati dealt with uh, diaspora you are dealing with, huh, this uh, topic also. So now, nowadays, like you have to see what is the situation today. Now, 10 years back, things were quite different. In 10 years, things have changed a lot. And the diaspora population uh, of India has become quite powerful nowadays. Reach, obviously, they are. Uh, and now because of that, there is a backlash in those countries. So today when uh, in uh, UK, uh, when uh, Mr. Sunak is trying to be prime minister, so how he is trying to uh, woo this Indian people and what is going against him, his identity as an Indian, uh, how people are reading that. So even in his victory, there is a kind of a defeat that afterwards people will have a different way of looking at Indians. So the way we are welcomed because of like talent or other thing, that won't be there. That is what is happening in America also. So now the identity is about like uh, uh, American Hindu is growing. Now, is that a reaction to the growing uh, this white supremacist idea or this is what will drive white super, super, super message, uh, that, that idea about Ku Klux Klan uh, and all those regressive white people, Western idea. Will uh, If the Muslim group will come together and say that this is our Hindu group will come together, this is our, then how those people will deal with that idea? So even that can be seen uh, that in diaspora that what, how they, those people, we keep on crying that uh, my culture and this and that happens, but we are encroaching somebody's spaces there. When they, so uh, that, uh, if you can find, Lila Gandhi has written a bit in, uh, from post-colonial angle uh, about this. A few more things you can identify. Uh, Kavisha, we told that you can try to look at some practical way about the concept of reader. So we can, everybody can feel what is to be a reader uh, with W uh, there. And uh, the difference one can see that. Kishore also did well. Huh? The Kantian things in a particular text. So that was applied quite well. Huh? And the critic also, you, you have mentioned that uh, in that, which is necessary that how you make a critic of a particular viewpoint. Uh, uh, so if uh, from a Kantian angle this way, but that may be another way of looking at that also. So what is that conflicting zone huh? that is good to always analyze? Uh, in, in Kunj also we have told practically you can try to look at uh, this uh, aspects there. Uh, uh, Lalji, uh, uh, that point is quite valid for you also. Like 
uh, when you talk about spirituality, is there anybody who has made a critic of spirituality? Hmm? Like it may be a, a, let us say there is a religious spirituality and then there is a non-religious or secular spirituality if we try to name it. Is there anybody who is making a critic of that? Can that help you in reading or uh, questioning Paulo Coelho's? I think that you have to add. So don't only read what Paulo Coelho wants to tell, but read against, or try to uh, make a counter argument against Paulo Coelho also. Uh, Mehal uh, did good work with the detective fictions, okay, and uh, Nayan's folklore idea also were quite interestingly presented. Okay. Okay, so with this we end our uh, uh, this presentation uh, session of uh, the morning slot here. Okay, I am ending this uh, broadcast and then giving some instructions regarding what else we have to do.